will be out of here. The meeting will come to order. We are now holding our regularly scheduled meeting held June 2nd, 2009, 9 a.m. And at this time, I'd like to call on our Public Works Director, Mr. Jim Davis, to give the invocation, and the Pledge of Allegiance will be given by Commissioner Bob Solari. Please rise. Almighty God, we are grateful for this beautiful June morning and for this great county, which is so rich in blessings. It is truly a land overflowing with your grace. We pray for your divine presence with us during this meeting. Grant our leaders wisdom in governing the affairs before us. In your great name we pray. Amen. 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 Please join me in the pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, commissioners, is there any additions, modifications, or deletions to the agenda? Very well. I'll entertain a motion to approve. Approval of the agenda. Got a motion to approve the agenda as printed. In, I'll second that. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. The motion passes unanimously. Move us to proclamations and presentations by Florida Power and Light. Uh, we have Amy Bunges. Close, Bunges. 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 Thank you. And uh, Bob Shara, <coughs> welcome. Thank you. Okay. And feel free, give your name and, name and uh, address for the record, okay. please. Okay. I'm Amy Brunges. I'm the External Affairs Manager from Florida Power and Light for Indian River County. And my address is 1050 Southeast Brandon Circle in Port St. Lucie. Welcome. Thank you. How do I get, uh, I just see, I just see me right here. Okay, thank you. Anyways, good morning, and thank you very much for having us here today to just share a little bit about our proposed uh, natural gas pipeline in the state of Florida. Florida's first uh, natural gas pipeline um, sp just in the state of Florida um, that we would build, own, and operate a 300-mile pipeline that will traverse 14 counties in our state, including Indian River County. And so we're excited to be here to talk to you specifically about that as well. We've already had an open house here in Indian River County last month, so some of you may be uh, more familiar with this than others, where we uh, invited members of the public to come and, and learn about the project and ask any questions that they might have. And we've also met with your administrative staff and talked to them specifically about the impact here in Indian River County. So we're going to, um, to go over it with you a little bit uh, more today. Um, I'm going to um, uh, basically introduce um, Bob in a minute here to tell you, we're going to tell you about the facts of the project, uh, the benefits of the Florida Energy Secure Line, uh, specifically the positive economic impact of the Florida Energy Secure Line right here in Indian River County, and how this fits into Florida Power and Light's overall clean energy story. Um, and I think a lot of you know as ex external affairs manager, I'm um, um, sort of the uh, jack of all trades at FPL and the master of none. So I'm really fortunate that I do have the master of this project with me and that is uh, Bob Shera. Bob is um, not only the director of this project, but he's the director of project development for our energy marketing and trading division at Florida Power and Light. And he uh, is the expert on this project. So, so he will be able to uh, not only give you a, a very, um, very uh, accurate and high level overview, but answer any questions that you have. So I'm gonna turn it over to Bob. Thank you, thank you for having us. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, guests. Um, thanks for this opportunity. Um, as Amy said, I've been working on this particular project now for almost two years. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's what I do the first 40 or 50 hours of each week. <laughs> Keeping this into a very brief uh, discussion will be a challenge because I love it. But um, please, I'll try to stay at a high level. And if you do have questions, I'll come back and uh, be happy to address them. And we'll get right into the discussion. Um, first is a, is a quick comment is that it, within the state of Florida, within Florida Power and Light, um, we rely on natural gas to produce a significant amount of our electricity. Today it's about 53% of every kilowatt hours, or of all of our kilowatt hours are generated on gas. About a decade ago that was about 40%. And within two 2018 to 2020, it could be as high as 70% or more. So natural gas is a, is a key component of our generation package. If you look at our mix, um, we believe that uh, we are moving very quickly into the cleanest 
and most efficient of power generation, um, not just within the state, but also one of the leaders within the nation. I said natural gas uh, makes up 53% of our fuel mix. Nuclear is 22%. Um, and the reason that we are as clean as and efficient as we are, if you look at the bottom three, you look at oil, coal, uh, you'll or oil and coal, excuse me, you'll see that we are very low compared to the average use of, of heavy fossil fuels in the nation. Renewables make up 1%. They're a very important 1%. Um, they're a growing part of our portfolio, but, they, but gas will, is today, and will remain the backbone of our generation. If we talk about the new natural gas line known as the Florida Energy Secure Line, I want to make a, a point that's probably not necessarily intuitively obvious, and that is that the gas that's going to be brought into the state will be used for power generation. We're not talking about getting into the local distribution business or delivering gas to local communities. Um, that's, being, that's being taken care of by others within the state. What we do is we will be um, taking the gas from the production areas, it'll be processed, it'll then be brought into the state. We will produce electricity with that, uh, with using gas as a fuel source, and that'll be delivered to um, our individual homes. Um, why do we need more gas in the state if we already have gas? Um, this is just a, a, a good view of the fact that within the state of Florida today, we, have a ba we only have two major pipelines that bring gas into the state. Um, one is the Gulf Stream line that runs under the Gulf of Mexico, and the other is the Florida gas transmission system that comes across the panhandle. Um, those systems from a contractual capacity are full. Now, as we go to expand natural gas and use more natural gas, as I referenced earlier, we're going to have to build, or someone is going to have to build, new natural gas transmission capacity. Um, what we're proposing is that we would actually diversify our fuel supply. About 40% of our fuel today comes from the Gulf of Mexico, and as we know, that that's subject to weather interruption. We're looking to diversify further inland into what's known as the mid-continent area. Um, and given the fact that the two systems are at full capacity without further expansion, we're looking to have a third unrelated party build, uh, I'm just following the arrow here, build a, um, a new pipeline into the state down to an area in Bradford County, and then FP&L is looking to build a new pipeline from Bradford County down serving uh, the Cape Canaveral modernization, which you may have heard about, the Riviera modernizations. Both of those are actually replacing 1950s and 60s era generation plants that use heavy oil and replace them with the most efficient, clean natural gas. And we're also looking to connect into the Martin plant, which is today the largest uh, natural gas plant in, in North America. I've touched on a couple of these. Why, why do we need a natural gas line? The infrastructure is uh, currently at full capacity. Um, this is going, the, the gas itself will allow us to um, to produce the cleanest of energy using natural gas and the most efficient technology using combustion turbines. And as I said, um, we're looking to diversify both our supply as well as our physical delivery system. I, I mentioned earlier the Cape Canaveral and the Riviera modernizations that are um, actually working their way through the regulatory process to date. Uh, Cape Canaveral is on the left, Riviera is on the right. Canaveral will be um, uh, brought into service the modernized plant in June of 2013 and um, actually Riviera in 2014. Got to find my mouse here, excuse me. Um, let me just talk for a moment about the pipeline. Now this might be a bit hard to see from the back of the room. We actually have some brochures if, if folks would like to see it. What we're proposing is a 300 mile pipeline is going to go through 14 counties. It'll begin in Bradford County where it will receive gas from the new interstate pipeline. It will um, come down and deliver gas, as I mentioned, to Riviera, Canaveral, and Martin. Um, this project will move about 600 million, million cubic feet a day of gas. That's the initial capacity. It's about a 30-inch pipeline. If, if those who came to our open house actually got a chance to see a, a segment of the piping, we would look to put this in service in January 2014. The total impact of this project is well over a billion dollars. Um, this is a significant impact to the state of Florida. The capital cost to construct, the taxable base that we're going to create, which I'll touch on in a moment. There'll be about 3,500 direct construction jobs. Um, many of those will be with existing <coughs> pipeline companies, some from out of state, some from in-state. But there'll be, there will be a ripple effect 
because we'll be going through 300 miles in 14 counties, the assumption is it will create about another or impact another 3,500 jobs directly. The project benefits, I think we just touched on, su supply diversity, uh, cost effectiveness, job creation, tax revenue, and something that's very important within the state as well as the nation is clean energy. Um, this project, because it is natural gas, is consistent with our long-term environmental statements. Um, one thing that's, that's probably key to note is that over 90% of the path of this pipeline is proposed to be in the existing FP&L transmission system. That is to then minimize the imp any environmental impact or any impact on residences along the way. I think we've touched on this aspect of security uh, and diversity. I, I think just in due to time, we'll continue to move forward. I can answer any questions. In terms of uh, landowner impacts, uh, we have an established real estate program. Um, our first step was to come out and meet folks along. Uh, we had 11 open houses across the 14 counties. <laughs> Um, we have filed this project with the Public Service Commission back in April, and we will be filing what is known as a Natural Gas Pipeline Siting Act application to the siting board, the DEP, this summer. And once that filing is made, then we will send out letters to all the folks who live in either a preferred corridor or adjacent to it, and then we will be contacting those folks individually. Um, there are significant benefits, although I touched on the jobs, what I didn't touch on is this is about a, uh, this is a $1.5 billion project. About 28 miles of the 300 miles will actually go through Indian River County. The taxable base of that is roughly $110 million. Um, we expect that in the first year, the benefit to the 14 counties that we go through will be roughly $28 million in, uh, in tax benefit. <coughs> and then there will be another $20 million from sales tax benefit. Here we go with this slide just related specifically to Indian River County. The, t the, the initial taxable value is $110 million and the to county total that would be paid by this project or by this asset by Florida Power and Light over the 40 year depreciable life would be in excess of $33 million. The timeline, as I mentioned, we've filed the project with the Public Service Commission. Uh, we will actually be making a fact, we'll have a hearing in Tallahassee in front of the Public Service Commission in July, make the NGPSA filing this summer, look to begin construction in late 2012 and be in commercial operation by 2014. Um, this project being gas, in fact, does play very well into the portfolio, the diversified view of Florida Power and Light related to power generation. In terms of gas, we have the modernizations. In terms of nuclear, we have the uprates for, for Turkey Point. In terms of um, solar, you've, you may have seen the most recent announcements uh, at Cape Canaveral as well as um, at Martin. We have wind that we are looking to place within the state and emerging technologies as well. So we are focused on clean, um, diversity, solar, and efficiency. And that is the, that is the trend of Florida Power and Light. Um, here is a, a bit of background in, in where we are as a company with ourself and our sister company that does work out of, this, out of the state known as NextEra Energy. We are actually number one in solar, number one in wind, and number one in conservation across the country. I think at this point, um, just again with respect to your time um, that was a, a very high level um, I could be happy to answer any questions you may have or, or come back at another time and sit down with you and, and I, I do have a, a brief question um, probably about 10 years ago there was a rather large dispute between FPNL and the St. Lucie County property appraiser of, of how to assess the value of the nuclear power plant and uh, that's obviously been resolved but the question that I have at this point is uh, you, the figures that you put on the value or the, for, for the uh, taxation mm -hmm. is uh, 110 million dollars. How do, how do you, or how do you, or how does the, our property appraiser um, assess something like that? To well, be that is act, that 110 million dollars is based upon a pro rata share. It's based on 28 miles out of approximately 300 miles being located in Indian River County. We had gone to uh, we we looked at it both internally and went to a third party source, and then applied the county and local tax rates 
where the, um, where the proposed pipeline would actually go through and we'd be happy to come back and provide the backup. I don't have the specific details to that, but it is looking at a pro rata of the $1.5 billion project cost based on 28 miles and the, I hope that's not me, but then, uh, then actually pro, you know, basing it on your actual tax right, rates. Right. Okay, thank you. Commissioner? Chairman? Yeah. Um, uh, let's start down here with Commissioner Wheeler. I just, uh, this, I, where does, I know where the gas comes out of the earth, but where is the uh, starting point uh, around the country for this natural gas that comes comes in here and I, I know up north they're they're putting in new gas wells every place and I don't know is this nationwide where there's a supply of uh, gas underneath the ground or is it just certain areas of the country well it's actually certain areas of the country but it's more widespread than than many of us might think if we, um, if we look at the map and I went back to the map I put up earlier um, of course traditionally the Gulf of Mexico was one of the, the leading locations or origins of natural gas um, because of the weather disruptions, the Gulf of Mexico is always going to be there. It will always be important to us. We need to get into this mid-continent. So what I've shown on this map, and this isn't representative of the entire country, but the southeast portion of the United States has substantial quantities of gas reserves. And what really has happened over the years is it's not so much that the reserves have changed, it's the technology to access the reserves, the cost associated with the technology has allowed the areas in western Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, to, um, to actually be producing more gas than they had been in the past. Now there are other areas that include the Rockies, the, the Central Appalachians, all the way up through the center core of the country that are also major gas fields as well. well I, I know in the Northeast <coughs> and in, in New York the last two or three years, uh, they've done what you're talking about here, but I don't know how big their pipe, the pipeline looks to be maybe uh, like a five foot in diameter. Well, it's probably about 42 inches, and, and what these blue lines are, and I'd be happy to send to you and have Amy drop off to you okay. or you can come back and talk about a, a, a larger view of the country, but basically what the gas system in, in the country is is an interstate highway of natural gas flow, and traditionally it's flown from the southeast, from Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas, up to the mid-Atlantic and up to the northeast, and now as these uh, production areas have been um, been expanded in the mid-continent, being Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, those areas, as well as the Rockies, you're finding new pipelines being installed. Is there, a, is there a, like a central coalition where all the gas producers around the country come together? Are there different companies you're negotiating? I mean, is there, I mean, I'm just curious as to how this, how this is, all comes about yeah. where they're drilling all over the country. Is there is there like one board that says, you know, this is what we need to do, like OPEC or something? Or <laughs> there is not. There um, is not. This, is, this is free market at, at work, and actually the benefit to the state of Florida is that we have multiple producers, many, many producers that are in, in this part of the world that are looking to move their gas. And one okay. of the interesting things about gas production is once they open these wells, the gas has to flow. So mm -hmm. what we're looking to do is be able to attract that gas and bring it into the state of Florida. You might be familiar with the fact that Florida does not have indigenous <coughs> gas. We're a destination state when it comes to, to fuels of any type. So it's necessary for us to bring the gas in. So it's very competitive. It's very competitive. Good. That's a good thing from good. our perspective. The other is by adding the third pipeline, we're creating a, an additional level of competition to the two existing companies uh, within the state. Thank you. Yes, a um, couple of things. One, of the 28 miles in any other county, do you know? Do you have a percentage of how much of that is already FPNL right away, and how much you're going to have to? We, I don't have a final percentage because this process we're going through with the uh, DEP siting board will confirm that. But where possible, and, to, and right now, almost all of it is in the FPNL right away. Okay, and I, I think uh, the county recently purchased some conservation land, and it looks like I know there's a big power line access through the, the middle of that property so and it looks kind of like from your map that's where it's going through can you tell me what, what how how does the pipeline actually get in the ground what are the impacts um, during the construction of it and then how does the land look once everything's done and, and you finished up well as compared to a to a transmission line the good thing about a pipeline is it's underground Okay. It takes about a year to construct, and to build this entire 300-mile pipeline will take just about that. The project will be broken into probably three segments or, or sections known as spreads, and literally you begin by, um, and Florida is a bit different because it's, the terrain is generally flat, and that's a good thing and a bad thing, um, but you, you generally begin by clearing the, the land, clearing the soils, capturing the topsoil, uh, then you actually excavate and the pipe itself, and in this case it's a 30-inch diameter pipe, 
is actually placed down into the ground. Um, it is covered by a minimum of three feet, but normally four feet or more of soils. Um, and when it's when the pipeline construction is complete, then it is revegetated. And after several years, um, there is no permanent marking of the pipe itself, with the exception of where you would have valve stations, which are necessary to isolate the flow of gas from you know from point to point, as well as um, pipeline markers. To the extent that we're able to keep the pipeline in the Florida transmission corridor, it will be in that maintained corridor. Uh, I'll say Florida Power and Light Transmission Corridor, it will be actually maintained the same it, along the same time that the transmission corridor is being maintained. Okay, then we have a, a, a detailed uh, CD if you'd like to see it on construction applications and techniques. Yeah, I, 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 I would have if Amy could get that, that for us. I'd like, no, I'd like to see okay. it. Um, and, and I guess because uh, of the diameter of the pipe, once you put it in the ground, there's going to be a volume of fill that you're going to have to dispose of. Is that going to be hauled off site or are you going to dispose of it in the uh, right away pipeline area the answer to that is a series of, of solutions depending upon the, the what's available to us on along the site in the right away um, but more frequently hauled off okay and, and, and I would prefer that just because um, a lot of these lands are, are uh, could be you know partial wetland areas very sensitive to changes in elevation and if you start putting that spoil out and mounting it up we, we find a lot of exotics come in your Brazilian peppers and other things so if you all can make sure that y you don't change the the final grade the final elevation um, from the uh, pre-existing conditions I think that that work a lot better one of the uh, one of the key parts of this process you have the the Public Service Commission which establishes the need but then you have the DEP siting board which is to measure the environmental impact um, of the <coughs> pipeline on the state of Florida and we're going through a very extensive um, review of, of all the types of things you're talking about now, construction techniques, applications, um, maintenance and operation. That's a public process as well. And actually your administration <coughs> staff or administrative staff will be part of that. Um, we pay a very significant fee to file that application and the cost for your administrators to actually review our work and review how it applies to Indian River County, your costs are going to be reimbursed. Um, not that that is the major point of your comment, but there is a, a point in this process that is specifically identified for county feedback, county and local feedback. Okay. And just my, my last comment is uh, you're crossing State Road 60. Uh, you know, we just got that thing done and fixed it. And if right. you guys could be real careful when you're crossing that thing, uh, we don't want that tied up any longer. Every road crossing, water body crossing, railroad crossing, that type of thing have to be specifically identified to technologies and methods for construction identified and approved. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds exciting. Appreciate Thank it. You. And you'll be able to get forward the construction CDs. And if, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And if, if I don't know whether you would like to email it versus just yeah. that, that'd be fine too. Super. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. That concludes our presentations portion of the agenda. The approval of the minutes commission from Commissioner Wheeler to approve the, the minutes from May 5th, 2009 and a second from Commissioner Flesher. If there's no discussion, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. Motion passes unanimously. That moves us to the consent agenda. Any items you'd like to have pulled, commissioners? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to pull item H. Any others, commissioners? I entertain a motion. Oh. I'd like to pull item O. 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 Oscar. Okay. Any other items? Motion to approve. Move uh, consent agenda as uh, amended. Got a, got a motion from Commissioner O'Brien and, and, and a second from Commissioner Flesher to approve the consent agenda as amended. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The motion passes unanimously. That moves us to consent item H. Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, this is a, um, uh, a request to extend the preliminary plat approval for Lexington Place. And uh, last night, it's my understanding that um, Governor Christ signed Senate Bill 360 into law which uh, part of 360 provides for a automatic two-year extension to any preliminary plat and so with that this um, this kind of becomes a moot point so I just move that we uh, take no action on it because it's already been um, extended through Senate Bill 360. Bob you'd like to elaborate on that? I would. It, it really hasn't been extended yet because uh, there's a requirement for a written application and uh, the two-year period begins whenever the existing permit expires. I'm not sure what that date is, but uh, 
the bill may become effective upon signature, may become effective July 1st, but. Uh, what you're saying is there might be a period in here between the two before they get. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure what the status is of, as of last night. It hadn't been signed. Uh, Commissioner Brown, uh, sorry. I was discussing this a little bit with Mr. Zito yesterday, and I think if we say that our uh, approval runs concurrent with the state approval, that we uh, obviate the problem of a three-year deal. So I think that covers your concern, or might con cover your concern, Commissioner O'Brien. I understand what you're saying. So basically granite, but the granite uh, with the ca caveat that um, it's the Concurrent with the it's state. It's not extension. in addition to the state. It runs concurrent <coughs> with, with the, the state. state. Okay. Can we do that? Does that make sense? Can, yeah. Okay. I'm good with that. Okay. Um, so that I'll, I'll move that we approve the extension to run concurrent with the extension granted by Senate Bill 360. Second. Okay. Any further discussion, Commissioners? Saying none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion passes unanimously. Item O, Commissioner. Pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, I'm going uh, fully support this and, and, and agree with the uh, holiday closing for the uh, county libraries and county shooting range. It makes great sense. I'd just like the opportunity for the county deputy administrator to be able to elaborate on it in the spirit of public information uh, as the holiday is uh, fast approaching us. Mr. Zito. Thank you, com uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, insofar as the holiday, Fourth uh, of July holiday, will fall on a Saturday this year, uh, the county will be observing the holiday on Friday the third. And as a better service to the public, uh, staff felt that we should close the the uh, library and the shooting range on the actual holiday. Um, so that'll enable staff to take their holiday on the third. And but the folks who work in the library and the shooting range will operate on the third and close on the actual holiday. Okay. And this one's in direct correlation with past history of attendance for both the range and the libraries. Yes, sir. Thank you. And I just wanted the public to know uh, what they can <coughs> expect uh, as the uh, our students are out of school and fast approaching recreation and hopefully in the libraries as well. Thank you. Uh, motion approved. Got a second. motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Second from. Got a motion from Commissioner Flesher and a second from Com Commissioner O'Brien. If there's no discussion, we'll proceed to vote. All those in favor of consent item O, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion passes unanimously. Aye. Aye. This moves us to the uh, constitutional officer and govern governmental agencies. I see our honorable Kay Clem, supervisor of elections extraordinaire. Welcome, Kay. No approval. Second. Got a motion to, to approve. Uh, Commissioner Wheeler, second from Commissioner Flesher. Uh, any discussion? I, I guess yeah, yes, I under, have some discussion. <laughs> under discussion. Kay, you're going to apply to the state to get reimbursed for this, or is it yes, going to have to come from the local yeah. taxpayers? Yeah, yes. and, and it's my understanding, uh, you know, there was some controversy saying that um, counties weren't being reimbursed, and when I talked to the department, they said as long as you get your receipts and invoices up here promptly, we'll see that it gets paid. So we're working on that right now. And also, it appears that well, you know, the fat lady doesn't sing in this uh, qualification until Wednesday at noon. But um, right now, it looks like we may not have a primary. So um, if that's the case, certainly Wednesday at noon while I'm singing and dancing, I'll call Jason and let him know that we won't need part of that money. So, Mr. Chairman? Okay. Yes. The only question I have, is the state defined properly? promptly? <laughs> uh, no. But, so you, you know, I, not that I – have I ever defended the state – but how in the world do you budget for special elections? How do you know how many you're going to have? Um, but I, I understand they they just gave them the money that they gave them last year for special elections, and we get in line. But um, we're working with them. We called them when we heard the first rumor we were going to have a special election to find out how they wanted the, the funding um, uh, presented to them. And, and, of course, when we had this happen with um, the untimely death of Senator Howard Fudge, they did reimburse us. So okay, hopefully. Thank you, Kay. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Seeing none, we've got a motion from Commissioner Wheeler and a second from Commissioner Flesher uh, to approve. All those in favor, favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Yeah. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Clem. We have uh, the Sheriff. Honorable Sheriff Daryl Lohr. Welcome, Move Sheriff. Approval. Second. Got a motion for the budget amendment from Commissioner Wheeler and second from Commissioner Flesher. Sheriff, you'd like to say a few words? Uh, thank you very much. This is uh, uh, the proceeds from the recent auction that we had at the Sheriff's Office on uh, May the 9th, and I do appreciate your 
efforts. It was a well attended auction, and uh, it was it, uh, very warm that day. Huh? Yes, it was. As a matter of fact, um, okay. I've got a motion for Commissioner Wheeler and second from Commissioner Flesher to approve the budget amendment. If there's no further discussion, we'll vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The motion passes unanimously. Sheriff, insurance reimbursement. Move approval. Second. Got a motion from Commissioner Flesher and a second from Commissioner Wheeler. Uh, any comments on that, Sheriff? Uh, no, sir. Thank okay. you again very much for your time. Yes, sir. Any questions, Commissioners? On the insurance reimbursement, saying none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, we have one public discussion. I don't see Mr. Wiggins here. If not, uh, we'll move forward, and if he comes in, we'll certainly have <coughs> the opportunity to speak. The public notice items. We have the notice of scheduled public hearing for June 9, 2009. This is the ordinance amendment to provide charging registration fee for sex offenders and predators, career felons, and convicted felons. A memorandum dated May 26, 2009. Commissioners, what's your pleasure? Anything? It doesn't require action. It doesn't action. require action, now. Okay. Thank you. That's what my pleasure was. So we're, we're behind you all the way, Mr. Right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, departmental matters, community development. Mr. Keating, uh, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, I'm Roland DeBlois, Chief of Environmental Planning and Code Enforcement for the county. Uh, this item has to do with a, it's a staff request for authorization to abate a public nuisance at 1234 13th Avenue, uh, Susan K. McGowan property related to a code enforcement case. Um, the staff's going to give their presentation and then after that, then you'll have the opportunity to, to say whatever you'd like and ask any questions you may have. Thank you. This has to do with a code enforcement case, as I mentioned, particularly relating to an accumulation of junk trash and debris. Uh, in this case, there's a, a scrap pile behind a, a fenced yard area, also some materials in a driveway. I'll show some pictures of that shortly. Mm. Uh, this went to our code enforcement board for an evidentiary hearing in February. Under Florida statutes and general code enforcement procedures at that hearing, after due notice to the respondents, the board heard evidence, concluded there was a violation, and entered an order giving them approximately 30 days to clean up the junk, trash, and debris, or be potentially subject to a $100 a day fine. Uh, there was a subsequent compliance hearing in March of 2009. At that time, the determination was that there was non-compliance and actually the pile of debris had gotten bigger so much so that it was from the code board's determination <coughs> posing a serious threat to health safety due to potential hurricane uh, hazard and because of that the board made a interpretation that it was a public nuisance warranting county abatement under our public nuisance ordinance right now i'd like to just show you a couple of pictures uh, this property is located on 13th Avenue, a little bit north of 12th Street. Uh, this is a general view of the property that was taken on May 27th. There's two main areas. You can't really see it in this area uh, photo, but you'll see it in the next. Uh, an area, a pile of scrap debris, which at this time is above the fence line. Also some materials in the driveway. Uh, this is a Another picture of the scrap pile, as you can see, it's it's essentially piled up to a level where it's above fence height. We estimate it's between uh, uh, 12 and 15 feet tall in this picture. That was taken on May 27th. Uh, yesterday, we also took a picture. The pile is still sizable, but there's it's apparent that there has been some materials removed, but nevertheless, it's still considered a public nuisance from staff's perspective and then also there's material in the driveway uh, under the public nuisance ordinance procedurally once the code board at a compliance hearing determines there is a public nuisance warranting abatement uh, procedurally after a 30-day period uh, the board has the opportunity to, to direct staff to take measures to abate the nuisance by essentially 
uh, entering onto the property and either through contractors or staff to clean up the um, the violation or the public nuisance in this particular case because it's behind a posted and fenced um, property uh, attorney staff had advised us that w there would have to be the extra step of going to court for a court order to obtain that access uh, in balance of private property <coughs> rights so what we're asking for here for staff is authorization to proceed uh, to obtain a court order to clear the violation uh, there is a fine that's already been imposed at the March meeting that is accruing at $100 per day a non-action on this would essentially result in that fine still accruing until it would have, if, if it was eventually resolved due to the potential hurricane has it however staff feels it is appropriate for the board to uh, authorize staff to proceed with obtaining a court order to proceed to clean the property and that is our recommendation okay. commissioners any questions commissioner sorry Roland, yeah, you said that an action originally started, there was non-compliance, and then the pile got higher after that? This is actually... Can you go back as long this, uh, this actually started back in October. At that time, the pile was not above the fence. It was a more typical junk trash and debris issue. Once we get to the March meeting, however, that's when it was apparent it was getting bigger, and that's when it, is, it was observed to be higher than the fence. Under Florida Statute 162, we're obligated legally to follow a certain procedure on notification. We went through a period of trying to obtain notification through certified mailing and regular mailing. There was no response to that, so we, again, procedurally posted the property. At that point, having tried the certified mail and done the posting, then we could proceed whether or not they were responsive or not. And they were not responsive during this process, which is not typical. So based on the posting and then verifying we had service, that's when we got to the February meeting. And again, procedurally, the board gives them a period of time. And at the, again, at that time, it wasn't of a defense to my knowledge. But once the compliance hearing came around in March, it was apparent, and as you see it, pretty much. And that's where the board felt that it was to a level where it was a serious threat and potential hurricane hazard. And if we went with staff recommendation number two here, which would go for the court order, and you might not know the answer to this, but what Mike might know or have an idea, roughly, I'm not looking for an exact date, but roughly how long do you think it would take to obtain the necessary court order from today? Mr. Glenn, welcome to the name and address for the record. Uh, thank you, George Lynn, Assistant County Attorney. Uh, we actually have a court hearing scheduled for next Monday, and we'll go in on Monday and we'll ask for a warrant to get into the curtilage area of the property that is the property uh, enclosed by a fence and we will also ask for the court to grant an injunction prohibiting in the future any type of accumulation of this type of debris so we we'd be ready to actually go to that property in about a week then uh, if the court granted the order yes sir thank you <coughs> and uh, commissioner just to follow up my office has been getting calls almost on a daily basis from the, the neighbors uh, on that street and even after code enforcement started taking action uh, the neighbors report that almost daily pickup trucks would come in to continue dropping off more and more debris. So even once we, the, we started the code enforcement procedure, they were still accumulating more and more That was my junk. question. That, that surprised me, and that was one of the... No, that, according to the neighbors, it's, it's almost a daily occurrence of a truck showing up and offloading. Yeah, uh, that was one of the most disturbing aspects of it, that yep. even after the notification, the problem got worse over time. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions, Commissioners? Seeing none. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Susan McGowan, the owner of that particular home. We no longer do that, and I apologize to everyone in Vero Beach for the inconvenience I've done. I've been trying to remove it now, and what I'm asking for today is if someone can give me some type of extension to finish what I've started and get it cleaned up and out of there, because it's wrong. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate the fact Mrs. Uh, McGowan is, is taking steps to finally correct this. I would say we go ahead and move with staff, staff recommendation. And uh, as Mr. Glenn said, it won't be until next Monday before we go before the, the judge. That, that'll give her roughly a little over a week by the time all that gets sorted out. And if she's got it cleared up 
by then, fine. If not, uh, I think we need to take action. Let me ask you uh, a question on this. And I, are we going to use county staff to do this, or are we going to put this out to bid? <clears throat> Bob Keating, County Community Development Director. We've been talking to Road and Bridge, and we anticipate Road and Bridge taking, uh, taking the debris away. What kind of a time frame do you think that'll take? Mm -hmm. uh, it, we've been in contact with them, so we think that they're probably going to be able to proceed pretty expeditiously. So probably a few days after the court order is obtained. Okay. Okay. What, any, any other questions or comments? Mr. Chairman, I, and, and I, I agree with the motion. I uh, just want to uh, verify that the, this picture was taken on June the 1st, Roland? Yes. And uh, about what time of day was it done? Uh, I believe this was uh, early afternoon, uh, okay. noonish in, in the early afternoon yesterday. Because it was, it was my understanding that Mr. McGowan was working on this feverishly yesterday. Uh, did, did you notice, uh, did, or did any one of the, your representatives notice any any change? We haven't been there since yesterday when this picture was taken, but I did put it. If you look at the two pictures, this right now on the overhead is, is May 27th, and between May 27th and June 1st, there is appears to be a discernible reduction in the pile up until at least yesterday, and after yesterday, early afternoon, I don't know what they've done. That's we've right. we've cleared it down, excuse me, to where um, it's level with the fence, and we're working hard every day to try and get it out of there. So, do, um, but yeah. I would need a little more time than a week. Commissioners, what's your pleasure? Well, we've got a, was that a, a motion for one or two? Uh, I would move to proceed with staff recommendation number two, and I'll second it. We've got a motion to proceed with staff recommendation number two, and. Um, Got a motion from Commissioner O'Brien, a second from Commissioner Solari. And if there's no discussion, we'll vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. The motion passes unanimously. And um, that, that still Thank does you. give you just a little over a week. Any other questions? All right, let's see. That, that takes care of our community development matters. We'll move on to public works with work order number five, continuing professional survey and mapping for the GIS services contract. Um, for Sector 3 Beach Restoration Erosion Control Line Survey. Approval. Second. A motion from Commissioner Wheeler and a second from Commissioner Flesher to approve. All those, in, if there's no discussion, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion passes unanimously. Next, we have the as built resolution and assessment rule for paving and drainage improvements to First Road from 35th to 32nd Avenue in Vera Beach Home Site Subdivision in River County Project 0522. Memorandum dated May 14, 2009. Move approval as we have built. Got a motion from Commissioner O'Brien and a second from Commissioner Flesher, or, or excuse me, Solari. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion passes unanimously. Mm -hmm. Departmental matters, Commissioners, utility services. State Road 60 utility conflict resolution with the FDOT drainage pavement project. Uh, UCP number 3026. You have any questions? Just. Uh, yeah, I'd like Eric to just cover this one a little bit, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Um, it, it, it seems like we had a little trouble with one of the contractors, and then this before us is kind of divvying up the amount due and then paying off all the other contractors that are due from this project. Is that correct, Eric? Mr. Mr. Olson, will you please elaborate? For the record, Eric Olson, Director of Utilities. Uh, this particular project was uh, part of three phases along State Road 60 from 66 to 95. Uh, the process was basically to remove and relocate uh, water and sewer utilities along the way for the uh, project. One of the things that was very important about this project was the time frame re required to complete the project. In fact, each of the contractors uh, of the three that we utilized, we met with them ahead of time. We explained to them very, very carefully that this project was time dependent, that the project had a uh, State Road 60 contractor in the case of the first two phases, Ranger Construction, that was looking to begin the process at a date certain, and we had to be out of their way. So we made it very clear in the process that this project had to be completed in a timely manner. In this particular case, we met with Expertech ahead of time. We actually, uh, before we awarded the contract, we reiterated to them very clearly this project uh, was very important, again, recognizing that there would be, in fact, the potential liquidated damages if, if, in fact, the project didn't complete on time. 
Unfortunately, as the project began to uh, ensue on this first phase with Expertec, uh, the process began slowly and got slower. And although we worked with them diligently throughout the process, uh, at some point it got so frustrating. Our staff was constantly no notifying the contractor that they were slow on the job, they needed to expedite the work on the process to the extent that eventually uh, I was forced to write a letter to the bonding company indicating that we were literally going to pull the bond, take them off the project, and literally put in a new contractor. It got that bad. So in the process of this, uh, after we notified the bonding company, they uh, did show up on the job. They began to re-mobilize uh, to some degree. And again, the process began moving slowly again. And again, we went through this process again, notifying them, warning them. This process was going to end into uh, some problems if they didn't mobilize and really get uh, moving along. Originally, the project was to have been done in this phase in October. And in reality, it didn't complete itself until April. So what we're bringing to the table, we have the right, as per Section 3.2 of the contract that they signed, to assess liquidated damages to the tune of $450 a day for the project. Uh, the consultant of record, Masteller Moeller, uh, did a review of the project time elements, deducting days associated with rain days, and even deducting those days that allowed for rain days, it amounted to 164 days that were beyond their contract time. <clears throat> Rather than assessing them the full penalty, if you will, the full damages with the liquidated dam uh, assessment of $450 a day, we actually limit it to those costs that the county received notice on. We received two notices, one from Masteller Moeller for $35,000 for additional inspection fees, and we also received notice from Mr. Butel, who had actually leased them a lot for mobilizing their equipment and working on at 74th and State Road 60 that they had failed to make payment and failed to clean up. So we're here today to basically just simply recover those costs, the $35,000 for additional inspection fees for the engineering company and for those fees that would have been due and payable to the Mr. Butel for his lot for a mobilization and equipment storage there on 74th. And uh, we're, again, I want to emphasize we're not asking for the full assessment of the liquidated damages, only those that we've occurred from this particular project. I will say of all the projects that we've been, done, we've been uh, working on over the last number of years, this one, beyond any shadow of a doubt, we notified this contractor more times. I have never, since I've been here, had to write a letter to the bonding company and say, it is so bad we're literally going to pull this bond and pull the contractor out. Mr. That's how bad it was. Yes, Mr. Commissioner Wheeler. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious as to why you're not going for the full liquidated damages. Right. Historically, we've had one other situation where a contract has gone beyond the time, uh, not to the extent that this has happened. And again, in that time, uh, with a water plant project uh, several years ago, we asked only for those costs that we've incurred directly related to, uh, in this particular case, similarly, there were engineering inspection fees done. But Technically, we have the right, but uh, we've, our, our staff recommendation is not to assess only except those that are direct costs. Well, we've, we've got a contract that spells this out. You had several verbal yes. conversations with them, I assume written, et cetera. Yes, we did. And, uh, you know, I, I, personally, I'd rather go for it all. Um, yeah, Mr. Chairman, that, that's kind of my thought too. Uh, you know, we're still going to be paying them seventy-five thousand dollars, and it's almost like we're, we're rewarding them for bad behavior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think if we have liquidation damages, um, you know, at, at some point we need to draw the line and say, no, we're not throwing away taxpayer dollars for for bad behavior. And maybe the next time they bid or the next contractor is going to realize that, hey, if we say get it done on time, you mean get it done on time? So. I, uh, I, I don't see any reason why we should be paying any more to them um, if we have liquidation damages that we can still withhold. I know, I'd also, you know, I'd, I'd like to see too when these things happen, and you may do it, I don't know, but, you know, we should have a list of these contractors we deal with, and the ones that don't perform should be on that list, and they should be excluded from any future, unless they change management or whatever, some reason that they could be taken off a list that, that yeah, we would right, use them because of lack of performance. This particular contractor, uh, we had had a previous job with them, actually a 
they were a subcontractor to uh, a project that we had on the uh, uh, bridge, basically the Wabasso Bridge, a directional bore contract. And we had some difficulties with them. And before we awarded the contract, we actually sat down with them and laid all of our concerns on the table and said, look, are you guys in a position to be able to do this project in a timely manner? They assured us at that time, they've seen the wisdom of the way, they have uh, found themselves uh, new subcontractors, they can do the project, but unfortunately, you know, the tale was different. Yeah, my, my motion would be to go for the, uh, the full amount. Okay. Um, I'll second that. Got a motion from Commissioner Wheeler to go for the full amount and uh, second from Commissioner O'Brien. Um, any other comments, Commissioner? Okay. In, the, uh, in that case, we'll proceed to vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Mr. Olson. Okay, next uh, we have the US-1 from South Relief Canal to Oslo Road to resolve conflicts between drainage and water. Sewer and Force Main, <coughs> approval work, or work authorization directive notice, or, or num, I don't, NOS 2009-001 for relocation of 16-inch Force Main at South Relief Canal by Shelter and Sons, UCP number 2952-120-123. Any backup commissioners? Move staff recommendation. Second. We've got a motion from Commissioner O'Brien and a second from Commissioner Flesher. If there's no discussion, we'll vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. The motion passes unanimously. Item number three, which is the Consulting Engineering Service Work Order 10 for, with Shulky Biddle and Stoddard LLC for Master Plan Water Main Extension on 16th Street and 66th Avenue and relocation of Forest Main on 16th Street. Memorandum dated. Got a motion May 19th up for pages 124 through 131 in the backup, and I've got a motion from Commissioner Flesher, and I will second that. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. nay. All, all opposed nay. Seeing none, the motion passes unanimously. Next is the approval of amendment number two, work authorization directive 2007-005 for additional labor and approval of final payment for underground re utilities, Inc. for utility conflict resolution on US-1 from South Relief Canal to Oslo Road, memorandum dated May 22nd, 2009. And it's 132 through 139 in your backup. What's your pleasure, Mr. Staff recommendation. Second. Got a motion from Commissioner O'Brien and a second from Commissioner Flesher to approve staff recommendation. And if there's no discussion, we'll vote. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, if I may, uh, Mr. Wiggins is in the audience now. If uh, you'd be so kind to go back to the uh, public discussion items, the, uh, if that's uh, appropriate. I, don't, I believe that's appropriate if there's no objections from the, any commissioners. Mr. Wiggins, we uh, welcome. If you'd like to say a few words that you had. Uh, <coughs> Request. Sorry, kind of late. Uh, getting here, I had a little problem. Um, name and address for the record, please. Mr. <coughs> My name is Joe Wiggins. Uh, address 895 11th Street Southwest, Bureau Beach. Um, my concern is uh, uh, a couple of things. Uh, well, we trying to clean up the area. Uh, especially on uh, 10th Court. Uh, we have been talking with Mr. Andy Bowler uh, uh, about doing some houses down in that way uh, for habitat. And uh, he's wanting to make sure that it's kind of free of drugs before he start trying to build some houses in that area. Uh, he's already built some on a uh, right off of 11th Street Southwest, which is a pretty nice community, and he can comp improve uh, the, the other part of Oslo by building some other houses. But he want to make sure that it's not going to be drug infested. Uh, right now, we got uh, a couple of houses which uh, should have been torn down. Uh, about at least three or four years ago. Uh, one is burnt by beyond repair and the other one has been condemned unlivable. And uh, I've talked with code enforcement. I, I haven't seen no action taken uh, as of yet. And 
in any other part of uh, Indian River County, these houses wouldn't be allowed to stand. And uh, my other concern is uh, uh, horses. Uh, uh, well is uh, this welding place right up off Oslo Road. Uh, they decided to put some horses, a horse pasture, uh, actually about a block from my house. If I wanted to be on a horse farm or something like that, I mean, I'd, I'd have built further out somewhere out in the country where uh, I could be exposed to a lot of animals. Uh, my problem is, uh, and you all know that uh, horses, uh, they feces uh, create flies and, and other, other insects and stuff which uh, carry other diseases and which right now I get a whole lot more flies around my house than, than normal. And I, I understand you get some but these have brought uh, a whole lot more and plus the fact uh, I thought this was a uh, a housing subdivision instead of a farming area. I mean, if uh, that's the case, uh, it's a lot of other things can be brought into that area and, and, and nothing won't be said. And so I, I was wanting to know uh, how this being allowed uh, for, for horses to come into a, a housing development area. You know, those are the things I had concerns about. Uh, Commissioner Brown. Mr. Chairman, yeah, um, and I think, Bill, maybe you could help address the two houses. But I know the building department has been out there and looked at them. One of them is is properly boarded up and secured according to our, our building standards. And the second one was a fire damage, and I believe the owner is looking to demolish that. Is that uh, correct, Bill? That's correct. For the record, Bill DeBrawl, Deputy County Attorney, I've spoken with Mr. Wiggins concerning the first two matters as far as the houses are concerned. Um, code enforcement has indeed cited the owner of the house that uh, sustained fire damage. It's my understanding that she will be on the agenda this coming month. She has indicated to the code enforcement officers that she plans on demolishing the structure. As far as the second house is concerned, building department has gone and inspected the house. It is properly boarded at this time. It is structurally sound. We have not taken any action, to my knowledge, against the owner of the property, against the owner of the house, as it is uh, uh, not condemned and has not been uh, targeted for a candidate for demolition. Uh, comment on that uh, house that boarded up. Uh, I, don't, I don't know when the last time you've been out there, but uh, it's... Uh, I, I was sitting right there at my brother's house where the front of the house is boarded up, agreed. But the back of the house, they came and tore the boards out so that they can go in and uh, hide their drugs and stuff, which I sat on my brother's porch and watched several boys go in there and get their packages, go out, sell, which 10th Court is uh, just about like a 7-Eleven. Uh, we, they come through, they pick up their package and keep right on through. I mean, it, it's like a drive-through. So it, it's really no stopping. And I, I agree that the front of the house is boarded up, but they've torn the boards off the back of the house so that they can get in to hide. And uh, not only that, uh, the house was uh, condemned unlivable uh, because of a uh, my sister-in-law was staying in the house and she had to move because of the way the house was. So uh, those, those are my concerns about that house. Other than that, I, I have no problem. If you can keep it boarded up without them keep come tearing off the board, that's great. But that's not happening. Okay. Well, we'll take another look at the back then. Let's okay. And Yes. And have we talked to the Sheriff's Department about that? I mean, is, is he aware of that house? And not so much Mr. Wiggins, but the county. I mean, I think that the Sheriff understands that those type of houses breed a lot of problems. And he should certainly be made aware of the house and be asked, especially in the near term, to check it regularly, especially the back of the house. 
I mean, if, if it is, as Mr. Wiggins said, a, a drive-through through drugs, I think the sheriff would be pretty proactive in addressing that problem. Yes, Commissioner Solari, I'll go ahead and notify the sheriff's department that there is a concern at the residence, and I advised Mr. Wiggins when I spoke with him that, that there should be something said to local deputies, local law enforcement in the area that there was a perceived drug problem there or drug house. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome, sir. And uh, Mr. Chairman, on the horse issue, I, I did talk with staff on that as well. The um, parcel in question is, is a fairly large parcel as far as acreage, and it meets our, our code and requirement to allow um, ancillary use uh, of horses, and you're allowed uh, one horse per acre, and uh, staff has approved, and, and this is the, uh, a, a complying use with the horses. One thing um, with the fly problem in, in the, the horse manure, when we're in the drought, the, the manure stays around for a long enough time for the flies to go through their cycle. With the recent rains, a lot of that gets washed away and it's not laying there on the ground long enough for the flies to go through. So probably because with the recent rain, we'll see um, a lot of that fly problem drop away. But it is a, an approved use at this point in time. Okay. Turn into mosquitoes. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> we wish we had flies back. Yeah. yeah. All right, Mr. Wiggins. Thank you very much for coming down, and we'll see to it that uh, your concerns get some get the attention uh, through the sheriff's department and, and our community development. Thank you. Okay, that moves us to the attorney's matters for the acquisition of right of way on 66th Avenue, Cannon Road 510. Oh wait, let's have a break, Commissioner Wheeler. Uh, would <laughs> like to have a break. <clears throat>
Will, are you going to do the, um, I imagine Bill DeBraw is going to do the right away, isn't he? <coughs> We're going to go ahead and get started if anybody knows where he is. I mean, we'll come back to order. We left off on the county attorney matters for the acquisition of right of way along 66th Avenue and County Road 510, which is 85th Street, on, and that's the memorandum dated May 27th, 2009. It's page 140 through 162 in your backup. Mr. DeBraw, welcome. Good morning, Commissioners. Again, Bill DeBraw, Deputy County Attorney. Uh, today for consideration, we have the apt parcel, and if you take a look at the screen, uh, at your screens, you'll see an aerial view of the parcels needed to that we need to acquire. There are six different parcels in question here today, uh, totaling 4.03 acres of property for a total of 10% of, of the <coughs> parent tract, which is 37 acres. If Bill, we take, they're not coming up oh, on the screen. Just flip that. There you go. No, they will. If you take a look at your screens again, you'll see that they have come up now. There's parcel 244, which is the large family parcel here, 243 is next door to it. That also contains a single family residence. 242 and 241 are vacant parcels with no improvements. Then we go to parcel 211. That is uh, also a vacant parcel on the corner there. And then 141, which runs along 66th Avenue is a long, narrow section of property that's needed for the 66th Avenue improvements. Uh, both the 510 improvement project and the 66th Avenue improvement project will have parcels from this uh, proposed agreement that we have here before us today. The landowners, Michael and Taffy Apt, are represented by Raymer McGuire, law firm of Fixel McGuire and Willis out of <coughs> Orlando. They have gone ahead and offered to purchase, uh, uh, offered the county to buy these parcels uh, based on an appraisal done by area appraisals out of Orlando also. Uh, as the memo indicates, all real estate appraisals used an MAI appraiser and they work primarily for condemning authorities. If we take a look at the individual parcels, Parcel 244 is a large 34-acre tract. It encompasses the entire area that we see here. The actual boundaries of the property extend all in the messily highlighted areas there. Um, it was difficult for the appraiser to go ahead and find similar parcels of 34 acres in size to be able to base comparables on that. So what he did is he drew an imaginary line and separated it and made it a three acre parcel instead of the uh, 34 acre parcel to go ahead and base his appraisals on at that point. So that was done for parcel 244. That was a special exception that was used there. Uh, parcel. 243 is also inhabited. No, in structure, no structures will be involved in any of the takes that we have here before us today. And the totals for 
all six parcels, the property was valued at $552,900. The appraisal fees in this matter were $14,100, engineering fees at $12,600, and attorney's fees set at $36,814.25. For a total purchase for all items, uh, $616,414.25. Now attached to your memo is the road plans. There has been a change. I've got updated road plans that I would like to have attached <coughs> to the contract rather than the ones that you have in front of you so we have the most accurate up-to-date plans included in this matter. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. And I believe Mr. Michael Apt is here also. If he'd want to answer any questions, I'd be happy to. Commissioners? Address this. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a lot of uh, issues with this uh, purchase. Um, kind of starting with one, I guess a question for Bill is on the, uh, the, the contract item 10, the, the Y River Farms. Can you summarize what that implies for the county? Y River Farms implies that if we would ever change our minds and not go forward with the road project, we'd still have to go forward with the contract. So we have to be serious about what we're purchasing. Okay. Um, I, I went and looked at this site and looked at some of the um, the appraisal information here. And with, with your permission, if Terry could put up uh, some of the things I did. One of, one of my big problems is, is I thought the original agreement with this attorney was that he would bring willing sellers to us and we would pay the appraised value for the land and he would get his 5.75 or 7% fee for that. And I remember we had a lot of discussion wondering, well, what is this guy doing to bring any added value to the property owners? Because if, if they're just accepting uh, the appraised value, the county would be glad to pay him the appraised value and why are we paying 7% for this attorney? And now it seems like he's figured out a way to start adding things to the overall purchase price to, to get it above the, the appraised value for the actual land. This is the existing electric light post um, on the, the apt homestead property, which is the, two, the parcel 244. And this is valued at $800 according to the appraisal report. Um, Terry, go next. So I did a little research and you can find an, a nicer three light post for $35. Or if we go real fancy, the next one is fifty dollars and i know there's probably some relocation cost to to move the post and, and rewire it um but the, the electric is already out there so it's just a matter of moving it back 40 feet rewiring it and, and i just can't see how we're paying eight hundred dollars for that the other the next one is the the decorative light post which is valued at one thousand two hundred and fifty dollars um, again i did the research uh, there's a three light decorative post for $99. And then if you want to go uh, uh, the brown, you're up to 218 for the same thing. Again, I realize there's a little uh, relocation cost there, but, but these exorbitant prices, I just have great offense with. Um, the next item on there is uh, a landscape buffer valued at $16,250. Um, this is the picture I took yesterday. You can see that sand uh, is it, very new. There, there's no, nothing growing on it. The plants are very small, like they were just thrown in uh, recently. The next picture, again, you can see this going down. Um, again, I don't know if this was just thrown in to try to get $16,000 out of the county taxpayers or not. Uh, and then the next picture shows the front uh, basically, any landscaping there, you can see the left of the fence is mainly weeds and going down to the ditch. To the inside of the fence is, is a, a pine and an oak tree and just and grass. And I, I don't see where there's $16,000 of landscape buffer on this parcel that we're being expected to pay. The next picture is on parcel 141, which is undeveloped. And the appraisal says... Um, that not only are we buying the land for over $100,000 an acre, but that we also are supposed to pay for improvements, which is landscaping and a flagpole at $33,100. Uh, 
Now, if you go look at the next two pictures, this is looking to the, the, uh, to the east along the property. Uh, you got some cabbage palms and the down pine tree there. Next picture is looking back to the west. Again, another pine tree down. But I don't see any improvements. This is just natural vegetation with a, a $100 flagpole out there. Yet this appraiser is asking us to spend taxpayer dollars of $33,000 for this. And I, I just cannot see how this can be valued at $33,000. And then finally, the parcel running along 66th Avenue. This is the uh, northern end of that property, and this is appraised at 50,000 an acre. The next couple slides, we're moving uh, to the south. Again, this is 50,000 an acre. The next parcel is 50,000 an acre. And then all of a sudden, we get to the corner lot, and the price jumps to 100,000 per acre. And I realize it's a planted one acre lot, but I don't, I, I don't see how anybody would buy a one acre lot for $100,000 on the corner of a busy intersection. And, 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 and so I have a lot of concerns about where the appraiser got his prices from. I um, do not like the fact that also as part of this, we're, we're adding driveways uh, on some of these lots that did not exist. We're also putting in turn lanes to, for, the, for the driveways. Um, so I, I am really opposed to this entire process. I think, uh, and also the, the um, attorney has also inserted another $12,000 for engineering fees, which I think is excessive. Um, I can see looking at the, the right-of-way and, and the road map, so yeah, it does cross the right-of-way, but you know, the, the last one of these we did, they had $12,000 of engineering fees. And I, I just think it, it, they're just adding things in here and, and I think we need to just draw the line and say, no, we're not paying for this stuff. Um, it, it, it's just getting out of hand. And, and I'm, I'm fully opposed to this uh, particular acquisition. Is that a motion? Uh, uh, may I respond, yeah. please? Yes. Please. Um, if you take a look at the appraisal, Adam, if you could hit the Elmo, please. Here you can see on the appraisal in front of you that the flagpole is valued at $1,150, that the three board fencing, 680 linear feet of three board fencing with hog wire and barbed wire comes to $11,220. The natural landscape buffer, there are 439 identifiable things in that landscape buffer, uh, such as mature oak trees, cabbage palms, uh, I believe, uh, and Mr. App, who is here, can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that there's a 100-year-old oak tree there. Often those will appraise at an excess of $10,000. So the improvements on that uh, for the natural landscape buffer come to $21,950. Uh, that's what makes up the appraised value. Not only are we having to buy the property, we also have to compensate the owner for the stuff that's on top of it. Uh, secondly, you talked about the landscape berm. I believe the landscape berm goes for 335 linear feet. It's just not a small stretch out in front. And it's my understanding, and again, Mr. App can correct me if I'm, in, if I'm wrong, that that couldn't be brought in with machinery that was done by hand. And so if you add up the $16,000 cost with the dirt, the transportation of the dirt, the labor involved, and the plants that are put on top of a 335 foot long buffer, you can understand why it comes up to the $16,000. As far as the engineering fees and the attorney's fees, they're entitled to those by statute. So there's not anything that we can do, even if the deal were to not go forward today, we would still be responsible for those fees later on down the road. Okay, Commissioner, I thought we left off with that you had said that in a motion. Yes, and I'll, and I'll just uh, continue. One, this particular page Bill's showing was, as far as I could tell, was not in our backup. Th that's Secondly, correct. all these parcels, it refers to um, value for curd, uh, severance damages, a whole lot of other additional things we did not have backup on. Um, and again, 
that was not an $1,100 flagpole, I can guarantee you. And uh, the, the, the natural landscaping, uh, while it may be nice and stuff, I don't see, you know, we're, we're buying the land, we're not, we're not and, and whatever is on that land comes with it. We're not double dipping just because it has a tree on that land. Um, if that land has any value, that they were to sell it for $100,000 to somebody to build a home on there and they would be tearing those things down to build a home, they're not going to have to come back and pay an extra $30,000 for the oak trees. I mean, when you buy the land, you bought the land and that's it. And, and I am still opposed to this. I, I understand. And let me point out that there were five separate appraisals. Each of them were about 40 pages in length. And it, I, they're always available for review, but I'm not going to start to put you know, all the appraisals and all of the justification in the memo. It's a summary, plain and simple. Okay. Uh, was it, Commissioner, did you second. second? You second. And what was your motion again, Commissioner? Uh, to uh, to uh, deny the uh, uh, the purchase at these terms and prices. Okay. Uh, Mr. Zito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. From the administrator's side, I did speak to Will yesterday regarding a legal opinion, perhaps not today, unless he's prepared to do so. But uh, with respect to the methodology used by the appraisers, it's a method known as cost to cure. Traditionally and typically, that is a tool for condemning authorities to utilize in lieu of or as an alternative to severance damages. As you know, severance damages are measured to the uh, as to the impact of the remainder, the part that the con condemning authority is not taking, but that which remains with the parcel owner. So they pay the full compensation for the part taken, and then there's an impact, if any, to the remaining property uh, in, in, by virtue of losing its, its companion to the condemning authority. Uh, in cases where there is a, a cost to, to cure, uh, it's measured against an alternative of the severance. However, in cases where there are no severance damages, cost of cures not typically an appropriate form of, of calculation. Uh, and in this case, the appraisal says that the there are no, in fact, no severance damages because the remainder property <coughs> has the same utility and land use. Uh, it's virtually fungible land, and there are no severance damages. So, perhaps at now I'd, or at a future. I'd like time. to address that uh, before you do it. Basically, it sounds like what you said was basically what Commissioner O'Brien said. Yes, sir. Okay. I, I didn't go through the appraisal in detail, but severance damages are damages to the remainder of the property that's left after the taking. And if the appraiser concluded that there are no severance damages, I think that must be an error because the parcel now has fencing, uh, protective area, natural buffer around it. If the take removes those features, you now have a remainder that doesn't have the protection of the fencing, that there is damage to the remainder, thus there are severance damages. Once you have severance damages, uh, then you look at the cost to cure, to replace those improvements that were lost, whether it be new landscaping, new fencing, whatever, the decorative lights. And the, the cost to cure is something that we can pose as uh, a means to cure the severance damage but it's entirely up to the landowner wh whether he elects to take the money allocated to cure those damages to the remainder and utilize them to put the fences back, put the landscaping back, or not, or to some greater or lesser degree. But if there are, if there's a remainder parcel that doesn't have the same protections as the parent parcel in terms of privacy, fencing, security, landscaping, he's entitled to severance damages and he's entitled to the funds that would be necessary to put him in the same shape, and that's where the cost to cure comes in, and I think it's appropriate in this case. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd point out on page 160 of your backup, which is the appraisal summary, that two-thirds of the way down is a bold heading that says severance damages, and the appraiser has written, since the remainder property has the same overall utility, highest and best use, and unit value as in the before situation, there are no severance damages attributable to the acquisition. So the, in the appraiser's own wording, he says there's no severance damages, therefore there should be no cost to cure, but yet they're asking us to pay both, and again, I find that 
I, I unacceptable. Find it, I find it astounding that he can say that there's no damage to the remainder when you lose fencing, landscaping, privacy buffers. Uh, if Mr. This, Debra. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the backup that was provided was for the from the appraisal for parcel 244, the large 34-acre parcel. So that might explain a little bit of why there were no severance damages found because the overall parcel size of 34 acres compared to the amount of take uh, well but was, that piece has the, the the fence along going north and south correct. on county road five on 66th avenue the entire property has a three board wooden fence with hog wire and barbed wire okay uh, mr zito do you have something you need to add uh, well perhaps there is an error but maybe that's a reason <coughs> to continue it and the appraisal how and additionally um you know, one for the common sense committee. It, it's it's just, what is the land worth? What is it going to take to replace what's being removed? Let's either have the county do the work or estimate and agree upon what it would take to have an outside contractor do the work and add that figure to the cost of the land. As you'll see in the next agenda item, it's much easier to get your arms around that methodology than this one. Mm -hmm. Although this may be an acceptable uh, method for uh, condemnees attorneys. I, I don't think it serves the commission well to try and break this information down. Okay. All right. I say, Mr. App, would you like to have any comments or sure. please? My name is Michael App, 6780 85th Street, Barrow Beach. Welcome. Um, the first issue with the turn lanes, they're already platted on the road. All we were asking is that we can make a left turn off that turn lane instead of a mandatory U-turn lane because they, the opening of that is right at my entrance. Right. All we were asking was to make a left in there instead of they had a sign posted, U-turn only. But that's my access to the acreage. All we wanted was a left turn lane. Those turn lanes were already in the road plan. That's number one. Uh, number two is the potential for that corner piece. Um, it has commercial potential and with it being a very busy intersection uh, the the value of that land doubles almost as commercial land as far as the uh, 50,000 an acre for the the strip along 66th for seven for 650 feet of that it's actually residential land and you're paying 50,000 for residential land instead of the 80 or 90 which it, or 100 which is, it's valued at so for the for the 110 for the corner or whatever it is and 50 for the for the ag along 66 i think it's a wash as far as the cost to cure it is going to cost a lot of money labor time landscaping and new fencing to install before anything can be removed or constructed as far as the light post and the flagpole, I understand they, they seem a little high, and, and that has nothing to do with me. That was appraisers and, and engineering fees. There's nothing I can do about either. But it is going to take an awful lot to put back, to move everything that I've, I've spent years doing. And, and, and I have no problem going out for bid and getting a price to, to move the fence to the new property line. But I, I want a hard number for that. We've and, then, that. and then it, your decision will be, yes, I want you to move it, or no, I don't, and then we don't move it. But um, this, you know, also in here is, is some $27,000 figure for clearing and fill and compaction and $5,000 coordination fee. You know, those are things I just can't, can't accept. So if we want to go out and say, okay, we'll, we'll get a couple quotes um, from local guys to, to move the fence, then I'd be much more willing to consider that than all this other open-end stuff. Well, I did get an appraisal for fence, and it was close to 40000 just to replace my fence. That's without land clearing, without fill dirt that may be needed, or any other thing, gates. I have an electric gate. I have, on all those driveways also, were permitted and platted. So it's not like they're get, we're getting extra driveways. They were already permitted and platted. And they, they cost 5000 each just to put the pipe in and the riprap walls you know, a minimum without dirt. Um, well, but some of those driveways may be permanent and platted, but they don't exist now. Is that correct? No, they do exist. Um, 
the one, the one on parcel two. lot. There, yeah. There's okay. the uh, the one on two on parcel two forty two. The two vacant lots. Right. They're piped and gated. There's they're not they don't have gravel in them. Right. I mean, I, I know your fence runs along the length there, but right. I don't think there's an improved driveway back to those vacant parcels. They were permitted and they were piped, culvert pipes and uh, sodded, and I have a gate in front of them, and we weren't going to put gravel until my mother-in-law was supposed to build a house on one. She passed, and we just, nobody built, so we didn't do the driveway as far as gravel. But the pipe, culvert pipe and gate and sodded uh, swale, I changed the whole swale and redid all that. That was all done and, and permit. Okay. Okay. Any other comments, Commissioner? Okay. Anything else from staff? We've got a motion here to deny. Well, I, I would prefer to try to iron out some differences and, and, and go back to, to, to a counter versus a deny. But um, we'll, we'll just we'll take care of this motion and, and go from well, there. I, I can amend my motion to, to to table this until they come back with something more acceptable. But okay. I'm, well, I'm, um, I'm not going to. I don't know what a legal ramifications are but if this doesn't go today I'm I'm rescinding my offer and I'll just wait till you guys are ready to widen the road and then it'll probably be twice as much okay. so just to consider that also okay all right commissioners I, I would like to to comment if you have a willing seller and a willing buyer even if the price is a little above uh, what you think is what it should be uh, if you get into litigation, the cost of litigation where we have to pay our attorneys our appraisers, we have to pay their attorneys their appraisers, they'll typically run up the cost 30%. Uh, so if you're looking at a $600 plus thousand dollar offer here, you might be looking at spending an extra 175 in litigation if you don't have a, uh, an agreed to sale. So I'll throw my second. Okay. Uh, and, and Okay, but, and your second was on the motion to deny. Now, Commissioner, you, you had uh, tabled that you made a motion to table. Is there a second on that? Seeing none. Okay, Commissioners, what's your pleasure? I, I would make a motion if I could, uh, but I can't. The first motion, did you go on the first motion? Uh, then he, he withdrew his second, therefore, that motion died for the lack of a second, and that was then to deny. Then his motion to table did not get a second. So right now we do not, not have a motion on the table in order for us to take action. Okay, I'm gonna I'll make a motion to approve staff recommendation, but in saying so, I want to, as odd as it sounds, I want to reiterate that or say that I, I believe everything Commissioner O'Brien said is accurate and actually well done. Uh, I just believe that the county is more than between a rock and a hard place the way this whole process works, and this is one of those things that if we do was probably the right thing in following Commissioner O'Brien's original motion <clears throat> will end up costing the taxpayers a lot more dollars and stop some road building that we need to get done. And I'll use as my fallback position, which I'm not sure is how, is how solid it is today, the fact that we are taking somebody, well, the result would be a taking of somebody's land, which is not a good thing. And uh, I think that's, that's a point that Commissioner Wheeler's made a number of times. I believe he's correct in that. Mr. I just Chairman. want to mention it puts me in a, between a rock and a hard place also. I understand. This, <laughs> I these, just, these are the type well, of things that, that, too. that often aren't good for anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there are, the way the system's set up, I don't think is basically good for everybody. A second. But I got a second. Yes, Commissioner Flesher. Uh, and, and Commissioner Solari, I, I agree, um, uh, except that I, I don't believe that the, the assessment of certain prices uh, that were, were given by the appraiser and then pointed out by Commissioner O'Brien were accurate. Uh, I, I would say well done with the photography and, and going out to one of the local home improvement centers uh, for pricing. But uh, in, in the end, I think there's some disparity between what the attorney's saying and what you have pointed out and what Mr. Apt is uh, pointing out too as far as a cure. And I, I think we have uh, three different opinions here as to what the price is, not two opinions. They're not just opposing. So it, it only convolutes the issue. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, Mr. Collins, as, as, as you state, uh, as our counsel, you anticipate this to uh, be uh, going forward about uh, uh, between $100,000 and $200,000 just in, in cost to go forward into court? Yes. 
and and I, I believe that the, the the numbers that we're looking at as far as for the light post and the lamp uh, would be paled by the amount of uh, process uh, costs involved and Mr. Apt has uh, just clearly indicated that he would withdraw today and then go forward into court, into court and uh, by doing so, we, we know that we're going to incur those significant costs. So I I'm support the motion okay. as well. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, this comment, then you can proceed to vote, is, is we constantly let ourselves get scared from taking any action because of the, the, the perceived cost of, of challenging one of these. And I agree that on a standalone individual case, this particular acquisition may not justify the cost of going to court to challenge it. But when we get five or six and eight and ten of these, and we keep getting socked with more and more money on each one because we're afraid to stand up to it, that cumulative cost, I think it's going to greatly outweigh the cost of standing up to challenge one. So on an individual basis, I think you're right. But on a cumulative, and as these things come before us time and time and time and time again, and we're scared from sta for standing up to what's right, then I think that cost is higher. But we'll... Uh, I've counted the four, so I know where we're going. Well, and, and you bring up some good points, and quite frankly, I believe we could probably right here in, in front of God and everybody negotiate the flagpole and the, and the price of those other things. Uh, the main thing is those, by the time we come back around to those and, and the amount of time that's going to be to do it and to go through their attorney, which is going to be additional attorney's fees for them to, to, to review this and Mr. Epp to agree to it, and uh, we're well over the price of an $800 uh, light fixture. Mr. Chairman. And, and, yes, uh, Commissioner Wheeler. Yeah, I'd just like to comment. First, I'd like to thank... Uh, Commissioner Bryan for the amount of work and time he put into this. And I think it points out uh, something that, uh, you know, it's kind of a catch-22. First, I, I hate the thought of eminent domain. I do not like taking people's property when they don't want to give it up, particularly if there's a domicile there or a business. And, uh, but I also think that government in general, when they do eminent domain, is very vulnerable. And courts tend to side with, uh, with uh, the landowner rather than government. And keep in mind that, you know, and we're doing all this so we continue to have uh, uh, growth in this county. And that's why we need the roads is because of what we've already had and what we anticipate experiencing in the future. But it's cost of doing business, and it's uh, one of the more expensive costs of doing business that we deal with because we're taking something that somebody doesn't want to give up, and anytime you're buying something from an unwilling seller, the price goes up. And I think under state law, probably because of good lobbyists, the attorneys and so on and so forth, have a uh, kind of a unique position when they deal with eminent domain properties. And government and the taxpayer are caught in the middle. And in some cases, that's a, a disadvantage for the government, but in other cases, it's a big disadvantage to the property owner, like some of the things we've seen take place in some of the northern states for taking property to build a shopping plaza for a bigger uh, tax base or something. Fortunately, that's not happening here or in Florida. but. Um, Kind of a catch-22. You, you know, you, there's winners and losers on both sides. Okay. All right, commissioners. Any other discussion? Any other? Seeing none, we've got a motion to approve staff recommendation. And there's a motion from Commissioner um, oh, Solari, and I believe it was seconded by Commissioner Wheeler. Yes. Okay, it was. And we'll proceed to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Nay. The motion passes four to one with Commissioner O'Brien to dissenting. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, the acquisition of right of way along Oslo Road, Beale Holdings, Inc., 43rd Avenue, memorandum dated May 27, 2009, pages 163 through 174 in your backup. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, this is a parcel of right of way located on Oslo Road, just east of 43rd uh, Avenue. And Adam, if you could put it is up on the screen. Thank you, Adam. Uh, the entire parcel is 17.2 seven acres in size. You can see it here outlined in yellow. It is split zoned. The back half of the property is RS3. The front part of the property is nine acres in size. That is zoned commercially. The county needs a 23 by 529 foot strip of property from the commercial side. That's about 0.279 acres uh, of, in size. Um, <clears throat> from the owners. There are no uh, Murphy reservations involved in this stretch of property. The owner, Mr. Joseph Beal, president of Beal Holdings, Inc., has agreed to sell the property to the county for $405,000. Uh, 
broke down that amounts to be $265,652 for the needed right of way. Uh, there is a barn and concrete paving that it has been valued at uh, $118,378, $13,000 $13, to replace the existing citrus grove trees and irrigation, and a real estate commission of $7,970. The location of this property, uh, the county will also, when it comes time to develop, will put a stub out right here where I'm indicating that's directly across from the public's shopping plaza, which is down here. Uh, there's also a drainage structure located in the corner of Mr. Beal's property. When construction comes, the county will also be responsible for maintaining that uh, drainage system there. Uh, the this is one of the final parcels of property needed for the phase two Oslo Road improvement project. Uh, aside from Cumberland Farms, this will allow us to go forward from 27th Avenue to 43rd Avenue Southwest as seen there. Staff's recommendation is that the board approve the attached contract for the purchase of the Beale parcel uh, and also approve a brief lease back as outlined in the contract uh, before you today. Are there any questions? Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, or sorry. It, it, it's mentioned in the packet that the purchase price was determined by an appraisal performed on an adjacent property. Yes. Can you tell me when that appraisal was made? Uh, that appraisal was on the Stamil property that's outlined here, just directly adjacent to it. Uh, that was a 2008 appraisal. So uh, what month? <sighs> I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Michael, do you recall the date? I, I, I don't recall the date. It, it, in, in, for me, it's material because if, I heard a date of September 2007 yesterday, which may be wrong, but if it's 2008, it matters if it's be beginning of 2008 <coughs> or the end of 2008. I think the 2007 appraisal that you were referring to was one that the county had under a different alignment. We initially looked at this property to go ahead and put a pond in the back RS3 site that we would get an easement alongside the road to be able to drain back in there. We commissioned a, a, an appraisal and the appraisal came back with an $8 per square foot price for the entire parcel. And we took a look at that and went back to the appraiser and said, well, wait a minute, we're not going to pay $8 a square foot for residential property and the commercial property has a much higher value to it. The appraiser didn't want to change his appraisal or, 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 or change his method. So instead, we found another location for the pond, went back and reduced the amount of right-of-way that we needed along the front to the 2.79 acres that you see here today. So. It, the appraisal was based on the Stamil appraisal, the neighboring property, and it was newer than 2007. Okay, that still doesn't really give me much. Can somebody find out when the date of that appraisal was, it, if that's possible, to help Commissioner Solari? And I, I have some of the similar type of problems that Commissioner O'Brien just had on the last one with this one, except sort of worse. Um, Thirteen thousand to replace, repair existing citrus trees and irrigation. Um, you know, if, if it was being appraised as a citrus grove it have a value a lot less than the value it has. So the fact that it has citrus trees on it and it's being appraised as a commercial piece of property, the citrus trees don't add any value to the property. They have to be torn down. So I'm curious as to why we're, we have a $13,000 bill to replace and repair the existing citrus grove trees and irrigation. It's my understanding that it's mainly the irrigation, not so much the citrus trees that are there on site. So you have to tie off the irrigation for those acres towards Oslo? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, any idea how long will it take to get the date of the other appraisal? We should be able to find it just in a few moments. Thanks. I believe Mr. Uh, Webb has it. Any other comments, Commissioner? Or questions? And yes, Mr. Um, Johnson, please give your name and address for the record. Uh, Bob Johnson, Corwin Subdivision. Um, which uh, part Again, is the county asking for right away? The uh, the red line is the Oslo Road, right? Yes. The red line is the Oslo Road. In that area there, the county the, needs the right away right here in the front. And what's happening? And and that's going to be a pond? No, it's not going to be a pond. It's just going to be for right away. 
and what's happening in the uh, <coughs> you're not buying the uh, right up to the uh, halfway uh, of the blue line there no nope. No, sir. The blue line halfway through the property denotes the split zoning. The front part is zoned. The southernmost part is zoned uh, commercial here. Back here is the residential. And what's happening to the uh, the uh, commercial? What's happening to the between the uh, right away you're taking and the uh, commercial? Uh, portion. Uh, what's happening there? There's an act. There's a site plan that has been submitted for the commercial. Uh, there hasn't been any action taken on that site plan, which isn't at all unusual. As as many other site plans that have been submitted are kind of lying dormant at this time. I, I heard the uh, Cumberland Farm uh, mention uh, service station. What what does that have to do with this uh, property here? That that's the only other needed parcel of right-of-way necessary for the phase two of the Oslo Road improvements from 27th to 43rd. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, sir. Okay, um, if there's no further questions, I'll tell you what we'll do before we move forward with this. We'll take a, a brief recess and get the information on the um, appraisal. Thank you. Come back or okay. Mr. Dubois, we left off with the uncertainty of the date of the appraisal for that was it uh, when in 2008 was the appraisal? I'm sorry, it was 2007, November of 2007. Okay. That was for the Stemiel property. Okay. All right. All right, commissioners, any other questions? Yeah, I'd just like to comment on that. Sure. That was material for me. I mean, that to me makes that a pretty old appraisal at a time when property values are decreasing at a great rate. Um, the property appraiser just came out with his information which showed a decline of about 15% from the end of 2007 to the end of 2008, I believe, with indications of possibly another 15% drop since then. There's a question. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, back when all these property things were going absolutely nuts, uh, vacant property was going up higher than, I guess, developed property. and also. I'm going by memory, but it's, I talked to Naldi back then, I believe, and, and it was like commercial properties weren't jumping like residential properties were. I, I don't know if that's accurate or not. That's a question. No, I mean, you had several people coming in wanting to rezone commercial property to residential because at the yeah. time that was... The so I, I'm just questioning whether, whether the appraisal, even though it's older, is, is good or bad. I don't know. It's a question. It's not a statement. Um, my, what I see on commercial property, which is very limited, is that it's also gone down significantly. <coughs> it peaked somewhere near the end of 2007, 
and have been significant drops since then. Well, there's, there's, there's the, looking at the, the commercial market, the, what that drives the value of commercial market is not a, an emotional buy. It is simply the return on what you can invest and then put on there and then rent out. And so the, the, you did not have that run up in the commercial market based on that simply because if the dollars didn't work, they did not sell it. Or, the, or, or a corporation or individual wouldn't buy it. And so there's this big difference between what happened whenever, you know, lots of Vera Lake estates jumped up to $60,000 a piece uh, so they could build a spec home and flip it. And you could get you know, easy money. And these commercial projects, it, it was not that way. They actually verified your income whenever they were purchasing these things. And so uh, I don't want to, I, you're, I, Commissioner Will, I think there's some, some validation to what you're saying as far as what has happened in the commercial market. Uh, gentlemen, anything you would like to add to this? Before? Yes. Yes, oh, sir. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Moore. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Chris Moore, Assistant Public Works Director. We pulled the um, uh, Stamil appraisal, which had been uh, questioned earlier. That was uh, November of 2007, I believe, was uh, Commissioner Solari's question. It was the date of that, November 2007. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Commissioner O'Brien. Yeah. Um, I, I, I kind of agree with Commissioner Slurry, but also, you know, a lot of times uh, in the past on these, particularly on 66th Avenue, we've taken the current appraised price and that a 15% sweetener to try to get a willing seller. So it, I, I think Commissioner Slurry is probably right. The price probably is, is lower than that appraisal. But if we take the tack that we've been adding 15% to get a willing seller, that probably brings us right back up to where we are. Um, I, I agree with them also on the citrus trees. I think yeah. they don't add value. So if anything, uh, you know, I, I could support moving forward this less than 13,000 on the citrus trees. Okay. Is that a motion? I'll uh, move staff recommendation with the exception of deleting the 13,000 for reimbursement for the citrus trees. Well, what about the irrigation commissioner? Well, that hold the 13,000 that you want to leave anything in there for, for the irrigation at all? No, it, it, you know, if this is to be developed commercial, that all be gone anyway. So. Well, the, the, my only just my concern to you on this is this gentleman probably still has an ag exemption on this, and it is active grove right now. And so, if you were to go in there and tear it up, then when you turn your pumps on, you wouldn't have a, a functioning irrigation system for the rest of the grove. And so, there there legitimately is an expense there somewhere to repair the irrigation system. And I'm not sure whether there's the, an actual pump there that if the pump is on the front or if it's further in the grove. Um, I didn't see the backup on, a, you know, repair to the irrigation. But if you do have a pump that we're right in the middle of taking, that get that thirteen thousand dollars could be a cheap figure. Uh, yeah, let's see here. Um, I tell you what. Um, you hold on. Uh, since you've already spoke, Mr. Johnson, yeah, let me give uh, uh, Mr. Mills, if you would, please give your name and address for the record. Yeah, Bill Mills, eight hundred Eighth Street, Vero Beach, Real Estate Management Group. I'm the one that has been putting this together for three and a half years. The thirteen thousand, he does. Commissioner hit on it. He does have ag exempt. He does lose that ag exempt, which was on an appraisal that was done prior in 07, no, November of 2007, plus the irrigation. And it is an active growth. He does have income on it. Mr. Nolte has it on the records as that. So that's where that 13,000 wasn't an arbitrarily, you know, whack it down and stuff. He's going to, he loses that income on those trees. And not all the trees are in good shape, I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. And I just think Commissioner Sorry's point was. Um, we're paying commercial value for ag exempt land, and well, so the, the thirteen thousand just seems well. In my above world, and beyond. it's nothing but commercial. Uh, that property, I had a contract next door at twenty five dollars a foot back at the hype. The hype is down now. We're down at nineteen. What are we? Nineteen? I, I think tw twenty and twenty one. It's what twenty twenty one. We're down, and also you know you're, you you lose square footage. We lost. 3,000 square feet of buildable by you all taking the property. So you can calculate that. Yes, we do have a site plan in. We have let it rest like everybody else because the tenants are not there. But it is completed and we are going to use it. Uh, but when you calculate, we lose that income at $16 a foot when it used to be $19 a foot. So that's how we come up with these calculations. In other words, I'm going back to what the rate is now, not what the rate was at the height. Yeah. So. And, and, and I appreciate that. I, I, I guess a counterpoint would be that by widening the road and getting the South County traffic driving your way, we're going to be bringing you more business to that site when it does go commercial. Um, I do want to, I guess, commend you that 
you, you applied your, your, your real estate commission only to the actual cost of the land and not the other compensation, unlike the, the attorney from the last uh, purchase. So thank you for that. Yeah, I'm trying to be fair. <laughs> um, you know, there's one reoccurring theme here that I think that uh, I, I think we need to try to get our uh, kind of ahead on, on, on the curve on, and um, and that is the some of the fixtures and, and perhaps some of the accoutrements on the properties that we're looking at. Um, if, if we could be a little bit more in detail, um, I mean, for example, there's no doubt that the flagpole was not worth what that flagpole was, but then it get boils down to the question, when it comes that far and it's in front of us, is it worth fighting over that flagpole because of how much it would cost us to go back and have additional attorney's fees? Um, you know, and so, you know, that kind of puts us in a situation where we can't win. Um, and the same goes with the irrigation here. I, I would like a little bit more detail to, uh, to find out what it would actually cost to fix the irrigation if we could and, it, and if, as long as we do that before it gets to this point um, I, it's not going to cost us any money but now to go back and argue about a thirteen thousand dollar irrigation system uh, which can be uh, more than that to try to improve or repair after we get done with it um, as well as the trees is something that I would almost like tighter figures so that whenever it's brought up we've got the backup to say even if we did it with our own crews this is what it's going to cost us this is why we think this is legitimate so uh, Mr. Johnson welcome um, <clears throat> the um, I think I, I if you've been out that way uh, you might have to take down one or two uh, orange trees uh, whatever to widen it there that uh, there's no virtually no trees uh, uh, for the taking of the ride right away and uh, that f facility that's there uh, uh, I think uh, that facility uh, would looked like uh, Mr. Legland's uh, nursery uh, 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 member of that ordeal uh, and so I think that uh, I think the county's paying too much for this right away I think uh, that maybe Mrs. Solari's uh, suggestion is uh, is appropriate okay thank you thank you all right commissioners um, any other comments okay um, I'll entertain a motion um, yeah, I, I thought we had one out there. Did we have a just second move? One? Move staff recommendation, ex but excluding the thirteen thousand. And, and just on that, I understand your comment on the irrigation, but we're also paying one hundred eighteen thousand for a barn, and there's probably a little overage in there that might help cover the irrigation costs. So. Okay. Do we have a second on that? Second. Okay. We've got, we've got a motion from Commissioner Bryan to approve less than thirteen thousand dollars for irrigation citrus trees. And a second from Commissioner Wheeler. No further discussion. We'll vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. 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 I voted nay. Okay. Um, now, Commissioners, the, that motion failed. That's correct. Now we need a motion at this time. Move staff recommendation. I got a motion and I'll second that to move staff recommendation. And uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay? Nay. Uh, was that three to two? Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. That was three to two with Commissioner Flesher and Commissioner uh, Solari dissenting. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioners. All right. Now, uh, just real quick, Bill, before we leave this, the right-of-way issue here. Yes, sir. The, uh, the resolution is necessity. I did receive a call. Could, could you send me the email about where we are with the other seven individuals on 66th Avenue that we were putting? I, you had called me about it yesterday, and if you could just give me that in writing so I can send it to the people that have called <coughs> me yesterday on it. Very well. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Um, under Commissioner Matters, we'll start with Commissioner Flesher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at, on the uh, first item, I'm uh, looking for uh, support to move forward with the uh, resolution as you see on attachment number, uh, page number 176. And uh, basically, it uh, moves forward with uh, support of gearing all of our federal stimulus dollars that we may receive towards uh, reinstilling American jobs and American products. And it's, it's, it's a motion of spirit. Um, it was, uh, I believe it was discussed uh, several meetings ago. Uh, Mr. Hetty had uh, come forward and, and was uh, seeking a Buy American only resolution. And uh, after discussion with Will, uh, I don't believe that it's possible and under advice by counsel that uh, we can actually achieve that uh, without uh, some serious concerns. But I'd like to move forward with 
this resolution as we have moved forward with a previous resolution where this board did not agree with uh, the federal stimulus design. However, uh, the day has come. The federal stimulus package is moved forward, and I believe that we should show good faith to uh, between ourselves, our staff, the citizens, and other elected officials that we will move forward and uh, do everything we can for uh, a, an American spirit with the process. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I can support this because of the wording. It says maximum extent possible, which gives a flexibility because I, I think. Probably uh, you're going to have a great deal of difficulty in almost anything you buy today getting American made. I mean, parts from GM are made in China and other places, and Mexico and Ford, and I mean, or whatever tractors are. So, but but I think that the intent of this is is uh, is good. I, I don't know, you know, how much weight it'll carry, but I think the intent is good. I you know, uh, to to buy American if possible. Also, a lot of products that are foreign-owned companies are made in this country. I mean, you know, uh, Honda Gold Wing motorcycles, for instance, are, are probably have as many uh, U.S. Uh, much labor and, and parts as uh, Harley-Davidson does because they're made in Ohio. So it's, it's a difficult thing to do, but I, I agree with the, uh, the spirit of the uh, resolution. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'd uh, like to make that in the form of a motion. I just would like to comment uh, on what Commissioner Wheeler said. I appreciate the support, uh, but I just wanted to clarify that uh, during that discussion about a m month and a half ago, uh, I believe I made comment where I had uh, difficulty in finding an American flag that was made in America. And there was but uh, one retailer that had an American flag with an American pole that was available and actually said made in USA. Uh, I, I don't know if the, if the spirit of that conversation or just the general sense of, of our American retail uh, society has really uh, driven together, but I'm pleased to say that uh, just about every retail outlet in any River County has American flags that say made in America, with the exception of one retail outlet that the, uh, the tag on the pole says made in China. So I believe we've made great strides just as a society, and I would like to just utilize uh, the opportunity to have this resolution reinstill that. Another comment was that uh, Mr. Hetty's vehicle was probably foreign made, and uh, after checking a little further, uh, Mr. Hetty's vehicle was made in the United States. I think, what, 70 some percent of it was. Yes. It's 23 percent or 27 percent was made in Canada. And my intent is to do whatever we can to raise that number and raise the bar, and I appreciate the support. Yeah. Was that I a second? Think, yeah, I, I second it. Okay. We, the, yes, absolutely. We've got a motion and a second on the, for the, on the resolution. Uh, Commissioner Solari. I think I'm going to end up feeling like Commissioner O'Brien's uh, two issues ago on this one, <laughs> but uh, I'm totally against it. And I think oh. for a number of reasons, actually, uh, Commissioner Fletcher just said that just by talking about it, without the imposition of new government rules and regulations, we accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. And I think that's the way to go about it. We don't need more government rules and more government regulations to get people to do what they can do by themselves. I think that Commissioner Wheeler's resolution in February was, was a very pressing resolution. And I'm going to read two uh, whereases from that and follow each one with a comment from a Wall Street Journal editorial, which I think shows the wisdom of Commissioner Wheeler's past resolution. Whereas current economic stimulus legislation will increase the size and scope of federal government in the areas of Medicare, Medicaid, and education. Uh, this one says, referring to President Obama, but his program has revealed a man on the, of the left. He clearly views the financial crisis and the liberal majorities in Congress as a rare chance to advance the power of the state in America. And I think that's the direction we're going. Even something that is going to have a, a more of an impact on the American taxpayer was the second one. Whereas growth will not be stimulated by the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, but said act will have tragic inflationary consequences on the American economy. I think that we need to pay attention to that. The Wall Street Journal article says the Obama program is going to test the liberal faith not observed since the 1970s. The deficit spending and easy monetary policy are engines of prosperity. If they are wrong, then Mr. Obama will eventually find himself managing the politics of stagflation. And I believe he's right there. But then looking at this 
resolution, resolution says, beginning with a whereas, the federal government has funded an economic stimulus package. It has not. It has borrowed an economic stimulus package. The next generation is going to pay for it. I mean, we couldn't even pay for the spending we had before this. We were borrowing money. So the federal government has funded nothing. Future generations of American taxpayers are going to fund this. And the next one, are, next one says these federal funds will be dispersed. That's probably true. They probably will be dispersed, dispersed at the state and local level. But it says, whereas American taxpayer money is the source of this economic stimulus package. No, it's not. It's Chinese money that's flown in to buy American Treasury bills. I mean, let's be real about this. It, um, this is not coming oh. from the American taxpayer today, and it's not <laughs> coming from American sources. It's, it's uh, the well-run Chinese con economy right now is going to pay for this. And then it, there's, there's the part of the maximum extent possible. I don't know what that means. I don't know many, how, how many more dollars. Say if something is built in China, and it's not presently built or manufactured in the U.S., but it can be custom-built in the U.S. Are we going to pay for that custom-built premium? I, I don't know. I, I, I suggest that by this resolution, we'd have to. So the price of something can go up 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 percent by this no, resolution. I so I, 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 my, my feeling is that, that by embracing this resolution, we embrace the statist economic policy of the Obama administration. I believe that's the wrong direction, wrong place well, to go. Mr. Chairman. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> go ahead, Commissioner Wheeler. Wow. Uh, that was my I, I couldn't agree more with uh, Commissioner Solari. And, and what I was seconding this for was, and, and I don't think it has any teeth. No. But it, it's, I, was, I was endorsing this as the spirit of uh, what was uh, said. And I, I may say, too, that uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I may even check on it. But uh, the flags may be made in America, but I'd almost bet you that the material they're made out of is not. <laughs> and and uh, you know and, and it, it, we're in a world economy, and uh, it, it's it's just a fact of the matter. And I think when we get to the next uh, the next item too, uh, we'll probably have lengthy conversation over that. But but based on what Mr. Solari said, uh, and I loved your speech by the way, um, and agree with it completely. I'll withdraw my second. You with you will, you withdrew your second? Yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead and, and, and second the uh, motion and, and kind of just to, to steal a quote from Pirates of the Caribbean, I see this more as uh, not so much as policy but a guideline. Mm -hmm. that, so, yeah. uh, <laughs> and, and <laughs> Mr. Chairman, that, that's the very intent of the resolution and uh, just a comment, if, if we do nothing, if, if we stand idly and uh, accept this, this funding from wherever it comes from, whether it's future generations or otherwise, uh, and we, we continue a, a foreign purchase mindset, uh, we are only sending our future generations further into the septic tank of uh, cost factors that you are so concerned with. Uh, as far as not, not having a directive, no, this does not have a directive. This is a spirit, a message, and an indicator that we are looking for a Buy American focus. It's, uh, it's not a directive that's going to cost us tenfold if we go forward. Uh, it's merely just a, uh, an indicator in spirit, and I appreciate that. We, we've again, I, my, the point is that we don't need the government to impose this in any single way. Every American is cognizant of the problems we have today. And I don't know every, about that. And every, well, <laughs> I don't okay, think so. And most Americans are cognizant of the problems we have today, and it's within every American's ability as an autonomous individual to choose to purchase American. That's what my wife and I do regularly. We buy local. We don't need the government to tell us that we ought to buy local. The vast majority of our dollars are spent in Indian River County, more so, I think, than the majority of this county. I don't need the government to tell me that I need to do that. As a matter of fact, I don't want the government to tell me I should do that. Because as soon as it's the government t that tells me that I have to do something, it takes away the autonomy of me as an individual, and it no longer makes that a moral choice. It makes that a coerced choice. And that is the road we are going down. Liberty is going to die by a death of a thousand slices. It's going to die at small little pieces that we're not going to be aware of. But we're going to wake up and find our rights gone. And this is the type of feel-good empathetic type of thing which the Obama administration is suggesting to us today that is going to bring us down the wrong way. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, just how I read this resolution, only, it only applies to federal wow. stimulus funds. 
and the only people spending the federal stimulus funds will be us, not That's the correct. average American. So basically all this is giving us the guideline as, as our local government to try to, to, to buy locally. It's not infringing on any individual. Um, this is strictly telling us what to do. Mayor Gilmore, welcome. Thank you. And I was just going to echo uh, what I'm, I'm echoing what uh, Commissioner O'Brien said, that if you read the, the resolution, it's, it's talking about federal stimulus money. And local Americans aren't going to be spending that money. You guys are. And we guys are. So when the city and the county spends money, I think it's really imperative to tell them to spend it on U.S. companies. And you wouldn't think that that would be necessary, yeah. but, you know, I think it is. Mr. Thank you. Chairman. Yes. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, further comment because I, I think probably, uh, you know, if, if you wanted a, an effective resolution that will actually do some good, is a resolution not to accept the stimulus money as some of the states have done. Yeah. And you know that, that we're, 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 we're right now with stimulus money and so on and so forth are doing a quick fix for an on for, for a long-term problem and i believe it's going to come back and bite us i love talking to some of these people that have been for all this and uh, you ask them if they're retired on a fixed income well they don't remember the 70s when you were paying 18 and 20 percent for a mortgage and that's common we can't print that money and, and avoid inflation well, commissioners, I would like to just real quick compliment Commissioner Slory and Commissioner O'Brien. Y'all, uh, on your presentations today on, on issues that have come before us have been uh, uh, just been have been incredible. I mean, y'all y'all both have uh, have gone above and beyond. But in, in an effort to move forward with this thing, I think our county uh, acting administrator right now has some or assistant administrator, Mr. Zito. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a practical matter, we have four projects that will be affected by or funded by the stimulus money under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Uh, the 20th Avenue resurfacing from State Road 60 to Oslo Road, uh, Babcock Street, uh, uh, Road Number 507, Fellsmere Line to the Brevard Line, and Barber Street, County Road 512 to Schumann Drive. Those three projects are all DOT projects and will be bid and specified by the Department of Transportation, not the county. There is a fourth project that we will bid out, and that's a 58th Avenue landscaping project. It's about a, roughly a $300,000 project that we will try to endear the spirit of your resolution if the board so desires. No, absolutely. And just let it be known I don't want Brazilian peppers. I want American peppers. And <laughs> that's it. Bell did, peppers. Did we not get uh, American bell peppers. money for the uh, transit station? Um, I thought we'd gotten a couple million to build the uh, the transit station as part yeah, of this. It, it, that, that may also be fun that it's not listed as a road project. Well, let's move on with this, Commissioners. All right, we've got a motion on the floor of, um, from Commissioner Flesher and seconded this time by Commissioner O'Brien. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Aye. aye. The motion passes three to two with Commissioner Wheeler and Commissioner Solari dissenting. Now let's go on to the next non-controversial item. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Somehow I think there'll be more. You're astute. <laughs> go ahead, Thank you, my esteemed colleague. Bob, you just want to go ahead and start now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, would you lead this off? Uh, um, I, I'd just like the, the board to consider the implementation of uh, local bidding preference uh, for local businesses in the county. Uh, this was discussed at the, uh, the, the summit and collective meeting. Uh, that was hosted by the Chamber of Commerce out at, out at Point West, and it was uh, well received. Uh, I reviewed it a bit, and I did see that uh, St. Lucie had moved forward, uh, and I discussed it with uh, Councilor Will Collins as well, and he came up with uh, six other jurisdictions that had uh, gone forward with this type of process. That would be, as you see, the uh, City of Point Orange, Palm Beach County, St. Lucie, uh, the city of Tallahassee, uh, Hendry County, and Charlotte County. And there are several that, uh, that are going forward in the same direction. The common thread is, or seems to be, that there's a 5% advantage for the, the home team, the county team. Whether it's, it's county team, it's, it's, it's regional, it's, it's for the, the local process, and the very, very nature is to instill uh, the possibility of local jobs moving forward as, as we uh, go through our bidding process. We did discuss, as you'll notice on page 180, is uh, whether 
we could have a, a local bidding preference and um, trust that uh, Will Collins would like to uh, uh, add any any further comment other than the the four points that he had that I know was all uh, well sent sent to you all I've attached the uh, st. Lucie uh, document on their ordinance and uh, it, it, it seems to be a, a very uh, uh, nice document uh, there are some concerns that the uh, councillor has uh, suggested um, uh, that there were some good points and and bad points in, in challenging and moving forward I will say that uh, uh, towards the uh, the five percent award where uh, a local business was was given preference uh, I believe there's uh, some concern that, uh, that we would just uh, trade trade off and and then re-enter into a uh, a bidding process for that extra five percent uh for uh, just as far as i'm concerned i would like to see a five percent competitive advantage for the local team by doing that there are a lot of different uh ways in which we can look about that uh, this was made available to me this morning so I'd just like to uh, pass these uh, along as far as a, a radius. There was some discussion as to whether this should be uh, considered for the county or uh, any businesses within the county, or should we have a, a, a regional approach? And I most certainly prefer a regional approach as I believe that it builds more spirit uh, towards what we're looking for uh, with our adjoining counties because after all at least one of the adjoining counties has already done that and they do cite a uh, reciprocity agreement uh, in theirs as well and a, and a willingness to join hands with uh, neighboring uh, counties I did uh, take the liberty of having a uh, 50 mile radius map drawn out um, would, would you like that on the Elmo if you as we're discussing it just to show the significance do we have somebody that can put it up on the elbow or I'll just walk up there and try it myself do you have a member of staff that can assist with that I uh, thank you I appreciate that Tom Tom frame is uh, you have a map. coming up but I do have a map Thank you with that if we can just uh, reduce that so we can see the uh, the 50 mile radius in order not to uh, alienate uh, other businesses that are in, in adjoining counties that uh, have uh, served us well in the past I looked at a, a 50 mile radius and in doing so that covers basically uh, just about every portion of Martin County as you can see uh, well over I believe it uh, covers uh, Okeechobee, our county, uh, portions of Osceola County, and most of Brevard. Um, no, about 50% of Brevard. Uh, but at that point, it gives us a, a, uh, a, a nice relationship with our adjoining counties. I have uh, no concern about including our adjoining counties as opposed to the 50 mile rule. Uh, uh, I just want to suggest what 50 miles could do or 60 miles can do 60 miles will actually cover all of Martin County uh, most of Okeechobee uh, a little over 50 percent of Osceola and uh, not really make all that much difference in Brevard County uh, such being the case uh, if uh, we were to move forward with general discussion and direct staff I would like to uh, opt for all of the adjoining counties to be part of our process in the spirit of good faith and to to show a, a much more uh significant regional approach a, a technical question before they could where does the 50 miles start from the 50 miles starts from your seat okay thank you at our address Mine. well it could have been at your seat but i really you had it inside the 50 chain. mile radius <laughs> <laughs> You had moved over, and Commissioner O'Brien is now sitting in your seat. I, I think you should go from Wesley's seat. He's the chairman. <laughs> <laughs> so moved. <laughs> okay, commissioners. Um, I just, you know, I had a, uh, Brad Shue email this to me about this uh, from uh, Summit Construction. They emailed this to me uh, regarding the, what St. Lucie County has done. Um, I found it intriguing and interesting, and I, I would like to look into it. Um, a lot of the the local contractors that I see out there obviously are, are um, could could uh, they're, they're they're well. 
out there looking for business and, and bidding on business. And um, and I'd just like us to, during these times, we could help out the local guy a little bit. So I have no problem with this whatsoever. Okay. Um, and go ahead, Commissioner Slory. Uh, uh oh. Here, uh, you, I, I, you have the floor, sir. Okay, I'm going to apologize. I'm going to be a little long. I could actually go on with the materials I have for about four or five hours but I'm going to try to keep it to about 15 minutes. I believe this is a, this is a, a very important issue. You're not on the speaker, I think. Yeah, pull it close so everybody can hear you. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm going to begin with uh, part of an article that was also out of the Wall Street Journal by John Gordon Steele, Why Governments Can't Run Business. And instead of reading the whole article, I'll just read two paragraphs. And politicians tend to favor parochial interests over sound economic sense. Consider a thought experiment. There is a national widget crisis, and Senator Wiley Snoot is chairman of the Senate Widget Committee. There are two technologies that are possible solutions to the problem, with technology A widely thought to be the more promising of the two. But the company that has been developing technology B is headquartered in Senator Snoot's state and employs 40,000 workers there. Which technology is Senator Snoot going to use his vast legislative influence to push? Capitalism isn't perfect. Indeed, to paraphrase Winston Churchill's famous description of democracy, it's the worst economic system except for all others. But the inescapable fact is that only the profit motive and competition keep enterprises lean, efficient, innovative, and customer oriented. A government led by a local campaign is simply bad economics. Individuals, if they want to buy local, should simply buy local. That is what my wife and I do. We do not need to have any more in the way of government regulations and government bureaucracy to have a buy local campaign. I'd like to mention a few things which suggest that government imposed buy local campaigns are bad economics. First, our relationship with Piper would certainly come to an end. A company owned by a firm in Brunei, Jerusalem, is certainly not a local economy. The Press Journal reports the following regarding the purchase of Piper. Commissioner Peter O'Brien, the Commission's Liaison to Economic Development Council said it bows well for the county's economy when a well-funded international company goes to business here. Other companies may well take notice. If they're coming here, they must see some opportunity, really see some money in it, he said. A buy local campaign, however, says stay home to every company thinking of establishing a subsidiary, a factory, an office in Indian River County. It says that if you do not originate from here, we do not want you here. It goes in the opposite direction of the economic development work the county commissioners have done in the past four months. To see the irony in this, simply read some of the March-April 2009 business development highlights in the Indian River County Chamber of Commerce. It talks about business development, recruitment, and re relocation. It mentions Develop a proposal for a French-based manufacturer searching for a 10-acre site to build a 170,000-acre facility. Continue to assist and communicate with a waste-to-energy alternative fuels firm, which is no, not yet in doing business <coughs> in this community. I relayed information on a 50-acre industrial site in Indian River County to a commercial realtor in the Tampa area. Talks about a German solar manufacturing company and talks about responding to 15 alternative energy companies that expressed interest for more information in our area via the 2009 Renewable Energy Trade Show in Las Vegas. If companies are told that they cannot do business here, then they are certainly not going to expand here. Local subsidiaries here or open plants here. In fact, by not doing business with people who are not local, we lose the opportunity to interact with them to show them why Indian River County is a great place to expand to, to locate a subsidiary, to open a new plant. In other words, we lose our best marketing opportunity. If passed, perhaps $1 million in, in county contracts might go local. At 5%, that's $50,000. Throw in $10,000 of staff time, and we have a cost of perhaps $60,000 for this resolution. This is roughly the funding cut for New Horizons, a funding cut which will result in services a services cut of well over $100,000 to mental health patients who actually need the care. Buy local sounds good, but it's simply bad economics. I would hate to see this commission sacrifice all the good work it's done in the, last, in, in the area of economic development in the last months, indeed, to sacrifice our long-term economic goals for a short-term political opportunity. In its simplest form, 
The question is whether economics or politics is going to win out. If we follow sound economic principles, then we will not implement any buy local policy. If we take the political road, then we have two choices. We can again choose not to implement a buy local policy. This is consistent with a smaller government which tries to limit itself to essential services. Or we can implement a buy local policy which takes us down the road to a bigger government and a higher taxes necessary to pay for that bigger government. Either road can be taken. St. Lucie County was mentioned today and actually the proposal that we're being asked to follow was taken from St. Lucie County. I'd like to note the irony in today's proposal. It comes from St. Lucie County, a county which has elected five Democrats to its county commission and is consistent with the Democrats' belief in and desire for larger and larger governments. Given a Democrat commission in St. Lucie County, I can understand their empathy for the Obama administration and its policies. Today's action is wholly inconsistent with Republican principles in a county which elected five Republicans. I, for one, find this proposal not only to be bad on economic grounds, but to be inconsistent with the political principles which I said I believed in and would follow if elected to office. That, sir, <coughs> is my shortened thank, presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Solari. Any other comments, Commissioner? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> The only thing I, the only, let me just start backwards. The only thing I disagree with Commissioner Solari on is today I don't see a great deal of difference between the Republicans and the Democrats, and I happen to be a Republican. Well, let's start here today now. But, <laughs> I'm, and, and I'm, I'm talking on the national scale, but uh, the other thing, you know, what this proposes sounds good. You know, you reach out and you grab it. We're going to, you know, buy local, do this, and, and pay a premium for it, I might add. And, uh, and uh, I think it has an elitist sense to it that we're better than anybody else, so we ought to keep everything here. Uh, we do live in a world market, and, and, and it's also, we're looking at, at uh, Indian River County separating itself uh, along with a couple of other counties from the rest of the state of Florida and taxpayers and people that live and work in this state. I also could never understand why you'd have to pay a premium to buy, you know, to use local contractors or buy local goods and give this uh, this discount when people if people out of this area can can uh, give you a better price where they've got a higher overhead to supply whatever we're buying whether it be a contract or anything else uh, I think that that also sends a message that these people aren't going to do RFPs or Q's because they're going to say it's senseless they can't beat somebody by five percent so maybe that five percent you're going to save could end up costing you an additional twenty percent because you're eliminating competition what made this country great is capitalism, and uh, capitalism creates competition, and competition keeps prices low, and you generally get the best bang for your buck by being competitive in your marketing skills. And uh, uh, to me, this is protectionism. It doesn't work on a national basis, and I certainly don't believe it will work on a local basis. And uh, I am just totally opposed to this whole concept of of giving a discount to somebody because they're local. They need to sharpen their pencil and beat their competition. And that saves the taxpayers money. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Flesher? Yep. Well, uh, and again, I, I don't find it to be a, uh, an element where we're going to prevent free trade and free commerce. Um, and uh, an early discussion was about, you know, buying, uh, we can make our own decisions and we can purchase something on our own accord and we can we can you know do what's best and buy locally um i i don't own a foreign car i do my best to do what i can for american jobs and for local jobs and the local economy many of us during our campaigns say that we're trying to buy locally we went to a local sign shop or we went to a, a local printing shop folks i did all that and, and I'm willing to do more. And I want to be able to encourage our local businesses to come forward. If they know that they have the home team advantage, that they'll step up to the plate. There's a lot of times where our local businesses uh, do not compete because they know that these large global uh, organizations are going to come in anyway, and they're just discouraged. I believe it's a, it's, a, it's a nice, kind gesture for our local businesses to feel that they have a competitive uh, advantage. Uh, in addition, 
the fact that if, if we're looking at local economy and local businesses to be able to competitively bid, uh, whether we're looking at a 50 mile radius, a 60 mile radius, or our adjoining counties, or just our county, we're looking at a fossil fuel savings. We're looking at uh, the, the economy and the ecology that people will travel within our own community. I, I just think it's uh, a step in the right direction. Uh, I, I don't agree that it, this has anything to do with the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Uh, I, don't, I don't agree that uh, China is going to be greatly affected by this process about a local economy uh, driven menu for 5%. All it is is a 5% advantage for competition. And, and I don't believe that some of the uh, ramifications that have been suggested are, are even uh, discussable at this point. And I don't think they're either possible or probable. But uh, you know, they've been said. But I, I would not support the fact that we're going to offset uh, any of the global economy by looking at bringing in a uh, and just a 5% advantage and perhaps maybe prevent some of the local homes from being foreclosed and some of the local cars from being towed away and for that matter for some of the local uh, residents and businesses to become out of state businesses and residents and then they could pro probably bid on these other jobs and come back home just temporarily and not pay local taxes but just do the work and then support another state and another, and another jurisdiction. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple clarifications. Looking at the St. Lucie ordinance, under the definition of a local business, it says uh, the local business has had a fixed office or distribution point located in and having a street address within the, the counties, and the fixed office or distribution point must be staffed. So under that definition, I think Piper would clearly be um, I, I d defined as a local business. So just, I, I'm sure at some point Commissioner Swarry is going to bring forward a motion to buy a plane and that Piper will be able to bid on that because they are a local business. <coughs> the uh, second point is, is how the St. Lucie County Ordinance is written is it doesn't increase the bid by 5%. What it says is if the, the low bid is, is by a non-local bidder and there's a local bidder within 5% of that, the local bidder has the option to match the low bid. So we're not adding 5% to the cost. We're just saying the local guy basically gets a, a right of first refusal to match the lower bid. So it, it's still keeping the price low as possible. And, and, and I look at these things as, as follow the dollar and what the, the benefit is when you follow that dollar. We collect a dollar from the taxpayers and then we're going to spend it. And if we send it out of our region, that money is lost and there's a cost to losing that money. If we turn around and reinvest that local dollar, that local tax dollar back into our community, it keeps somebody working, it keeps them paying their property tax and keeps another business in, in business. So I don't have any, any hard disagreement with this. I would like to look at it some more. I'd actually like to have staff uh, if possible, go back over the last six months, any of the, any of the things we sent out for bid, and just kind of do a, a, a forensic examination of how, if this had been in place six months ago, how many times would it would have impacted something and where we're at. Um, but I, I think it's worthy of looking at it some more. If we do enact it, uh, I, I do believe it should only be on a temporary basis like we did with the uh, impact fee waivers because of the the uh, economic climate. So I would think the, the six month or the 12 month that uh, St. Lucie has in here uh, would be an appropriate thing to look at and reevaluate. And um, while, while the 50 mile thing, I think it's good. I, I think it, it, it could lead to a lot of work saying, okay, are, are you 50 miles and, and 50 10 miles. feet or, you know, I, I really just say, let's pick the counties we, we, we kiss up to Brevard, Osceola, Okeechobee, St. Lucie and also Martin County is because those are our, our regional partners for a long time. They've been the Treasure Coast, Research Coast, and I think those are our, our partners. So I'd like to see it just defined as a county and not worry about a, a, the 50 mile line for inside or outside of that. But uh, I, I would like to see this further, you know, maybe have staff 
work out a little bit and then bring it back for uh, further discussion. I, I would too, but I think it, the, an easy way to do it is any counties that are within a 50 mile radius of us. And that would throw in, you know, Glades and, and Palm Beach and Osceola County. But um, looking at some of the road projects, for example, we've got coming up, I believe that Ranger is, um, is out of Palm Beach, Ranger Construction. Um, and at the same time, they're going to have several people up here that I know that do work for Ranger Construction. Uh, that Don't live they right have a, uh, an office in St. Lucie? I now? do. I, I think they do. Um, but that, and that's just an example, though, of uh, and for, like you were talking about, if we do Brevard County, go ahead. And it's uh, any counties that are in a 50 mile radius would be very simple. It, it's pretty simple to see which one those are. And then as long as you're in those counties, that may be easier than um, than specific. Mm -hmm. But uh, so yes. And, uh, I, I, would, I would like to uh, make a motion to direct staff to, uh, that's our legal counsel, to uh, review St. Lucie's ordinance, uh, accept and absorb what has been discussed today, and uh, bring, bring that back in, in a much more refined tool. Okay. Um, sure. uh, do we have a second on that? I'll second the motion. Okay. Uh, yes, Commissioner Wheeler. Yeah, I, I, you, know, you know, one of the scenarios could be sometimes we, we jump, I, I, every time... <laughs> On every level, whenever I've seen government try to mess with the economy, they only make it worse, not better. I can't think of any exceptions. <clears throat> but, you know, suppose you had somebody from Orange County that uh, that uh, some company from Indian River County bid on and was the lowest bid, and uh, but yet we wouldn't allow a company from Orange County to come in here. I think if that was brought forward, the commission would say, well, <laughs> you know, they're going to let our people in their county. Why should we let their people in their county? I think it's. It, I think that's a spinoff that you're you're very likely to see, mm -hmm. as we move in from county to county protectionism, and and just as a closing, I got to tell you what: simple economics, simple economics, less competition, higher price. It's just the way it works, and you're going to be taxing the taxpayer to pay more to keep money local, okay. and the best person for the best price for the best product should get the job, regardless of where their location is. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. I'll just, my finishing remarks will be, I can't, I hope that we will not go down this road where we discriminate against one American because he lives 50 or 60 miles away. And this, this problem of the other, that we always have to be against some other. We saw this in the last big issue that came before us in the county, which was the growth, no growth. Suddenly, developers were evil. They were bad. They were the other, and we discriminated against, or people tried to discriminate against them. And as that th happened, it was first the developers, oh, then it was the developers and Western landowners, and then it got to the point it was developers, Western landowners, and any professionals who helped them. Now that growth has slowed down, we're set to discriminate against another body of Americans, those who live more than 50 miles away from us or those who live in a certain set, set of counties. I don't believe that's the American way. I think that's wrong. It was wrong each and every time in our history when we discriminated against people because of some qualification like that. And I would like to think that this county and the, the elected officials in this county understand that all Americans, if they're law-abiding, deserve all the rights of every American. That said, I'm done unless this comes up again and I guess I get to repeat the performance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Aye. aye. Nay. The, the, thank you, Commissioner. I knew what you meant. That uh, the motion passes three to two with Commissioner Solari and Commissioner Wheeler dissenting. Okay. Two two with great ne next, next, the uh, Commissioner Solari. Well, that's where you go. Again. I actually yeah. think I'll probably be a little you shorter got this prepared? time. <laughs> All right. You're gonna wing it. <laughs> I've got a couple items here. The one, the first one is fire hydrant maintenance. And this was one of those issues which seemed relatively simple at the start and seemed to get more and more complicated as it dug into it. This was before us sometime in the past when we were talking about the charge that Felsmere was charging us for hydrants. And Felsmere up their charge from $170 to $225. And in looking through this, it turns out that there are really two issues. One is how much is being charged and the other is who makes the charge and so it may be a little difficult to follow but I think the commissioner's got a piece of backup from Jason Brown which talks about the number of hydrants in each locale and the cost to maintain them and if you go to that page uh, you'll see that 
the total invoiced in 2006-2007 was $335,240. And as the municipalities increase their charge, the amount that any River County charge decreases from $67 down to $61. And when I asked about that, it, it turns out that the county sometime back decided to cap the amount it would charge the MSTU at $335,000. So what's happening now is the county is using its maintenance cost for hydrant as a plug. And as the municipalities increase their price, the amount that we get is lowered. At this point, the, es the estimated maintenance cost for the county to do the hydrants is $73 a, a hydrant. So we're now being paid less at $61 a hydrant than our cost. And we're doing that so that the municipalities can get a larger profit margin, which I think is actually going the, the wrong way. But that's, that's the one problem, which is the cost. The other issue is, in most areas, it's utility customers which pay for the hydrant maintenance, and that's because the utility customers get the benefit of it. So we have the fact that most utilities don't charge either the general fund or the MSTU. They just have their customers pay for it. So we have those two different issues. How much we're going to charge or allow other municipalities charge us and if we should really charge them at all. So at this point, I'd probably recommend that we do just a little bit more research and maybe have a presentation. But keep in mind the, f the idea that with the going forward, I don't think that we should be basically subsidizing the profit margin of Felsmere and the city of Vail Beach. Okay. I, know, I don't have a problem with that, but what's the answer? Well, I think that actually the answer is to have the utility bear the cost of the fire hydrants. So we take it out as a charge to the MSTUs entirely and just let the utility customer <coughs> bear that cost. And the, the part of the reasoning is because it's the utility customer that gets the benefit of it because not only is the hydrant closer to a house, but they get a reduction in their insurance rate for fire insurance for it. How, well, you know, when you get into that, how are you going to determine where to draw the line again? Uh, for instance, uh, Vero Lakes Estates, they've got houses within 500 or 1,000 feet. They may not be on utilities, but they're going to benefit from that hydrant if they have a fire. Well, some people will, will get that benefit. And, uh, you know, we have a taxing district for public safety. And so I, 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 I don't know that I have an answer, but well, I you think, know, you, I, you know, I, interesting. That was the, the direction I want to go. But for <coughs> sure, I don't see how we can continue basically subsidizing the, the profit margin of Felsmere and the city of Vero Beach. Well, I agree. With I mean, that. we ought to, at, at the very least, s agree to a maintenance fee, you know, whether it's the $73 cost to the county or $75 or something like that. Uh, it'll save us if, if we had the same $73 charge across the board, it would save $81,250. Let's, um, let's do this. Perhaps the wise thing to do here is to see, uh, direct legal staff to see if, they, we can, if that can be a part of the utilities. Um, I mean, with that being, I imagine there's ordinance on what you can and can't charge in the utility side of it. I, just, I follow the logic of the utilities with the water line being in place and the hydrant and the, the reduction in, of the taxes, but I don't know whether that can be a fee that we actually assess on our, u our utility well, side. I'd certainly like to see if we can pursue the idea of if, uh, at least Indian River County doing the maintenance. If it's costing us six, $73 per hydrant, I'd like to see if the, we could take that in-house at, at the very least rather than pay Felsmere $225 a hydrant. Well, let's, um, would that be, that probably is another legal question. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. So let me make that a two-prong two approach then to, yeah. uh, in, in the form of a motion to direct uh, legal staff. that in the form of a motion to direct legal staff to first see if this is something that we can take in-house, and second, what, what the ramifications are of having the utility co company bear, utility customer bear the cost. <coughs> Got a motion oh, okay. and a second motion from Commissioner Solari and second from Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, discussion, Commissioner? Yeah, just I, I would like to see uh, staff, when this is staffed, on, uh, on whether it goes to the fire district or utilities or wherever the cost goes, that uh, you know they can get their heads together and come up with a uh, recommendation and uh, how they got there so we can evaluate it. Okay. And from my point of view, if it takes a month, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just okay, so we've got a motion on the floor to direct county attorneys to, uh, the, the, to 
determine at whether or not it's feasible to do as a utility item or whether it's feasible to do it as a uh, to, to take it and, and do it in-house on the county side versus the uh, the municipalities doing that and then come back with a recommendation on a basis for action to be able to uh, get the cost of the fire hydrant maintenance under control any further discussion commissioners saying then all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. all opposed nay wow we had a unanimous one all right second one is some annual association fees the first one is the national association of counties we now pay two thousand one hundred seventy dollars a year to be part of naco and originally i didn't see the benefit of this however we all got a sheet of paper from commissioner o'brien and th there may well be benefits which weren't the cost so given that uh, commissioner o'brien pointed out to me i'd like him to discuss a little further if you would yeah uh thank you commissioner sorry about a year ago um, through our, our partnership and association with NACO, we were able to offer a prescription uh, discount card that's free to all citizens uh, in Indian River County. And the, the sheet I passed out uh, to the commissioners just shows the, the monthly use of the prescription card. And uh, ironically enough, April was our, our highest uh, utilization to date. We're over 285 county residents use a prescription card and saved a total of, of over $6,500 uh, off of the retail price of the um, prescriptions. Since the program inception, uh, our residents have saved over $56,000 in prescription costs. So uh, I, I think that this is something we can offer the taxpayers through our association with NACO. And I think it, you know for the $2,000, the, the, the tens of thousands of dollars of benefit our citizens are getting is, is more than offset. And I think it has a very high positive cost to benefit ratio. So I would, I would urge uh, Commissioner uh, Solari to uh, consider keeping our association or our membership with, the, uh, with NACO. Yeah, that said, I'm fine with that. Okay. And so we're just, we don't have to take any action then? Is correct. That? Okay. Next. Now, I'm going to combine B with three committee meetings. Oh, all of us, each one of us are, are, is a member of 12, 13, 14 committees, and these cost both a lot in time and money. Uh, and I'm going to, a few weeks ago, I suggested that we look at our committees and see if there is some that we can cut. I'm going to begin the process next week and let the commissioners do their committees at their leisure. But in going through some of our, the committees that I'm on, there were two that stuck out. One was PLAB, Public Library Advisory Committee, and Initially, at the first meeting, we had 12 meetings a year scheduled. We, evidently, the committee never met that often. But it turns out that with the opening of the Brackett Library, and given that we're in a time of tight budgets, we probably don't have a need for that committee to meet too often. We had already agreed to go from 12 to four meetings. But I believe that if we just plan at PLAB to have a meeting for the, or that's uh, tied to the opening of the Brackett Library, that we'll be able to go forward for at least the next couple of years with just an organizational meeting, say in January, and basically cut those meetings down to one, once a year. And then as things change, perhaps, and as impact fees grow in the library fund, and it seems that we're gonna be able to do something else, then we'll start scheduling more meetings. So that would be PLAB. The other one is the Treasure Coast Council of Local Governments, which I wanna make sure that everyone distinguishes and doesn't confuse from the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council. The Treasure Coast, Council of Local Government seems to be a meeting in, look in search of a purpose. I've attended it three times. I can't really find a purpose for it. I asked actually for their mission statement and statement of goals and objectives and evidently they don't have one. Uh, the meetings are nice but not at all necessary and I for one even though it's just four hours a month could certainly put those four hours to better use serving the citizens of Indian River County. And though the savings is only $200 a year, I still think at these times $200,000 helps, I mean, excuse me, $200 helps. So I'm gonna make the recommendation that we drop out of the Treasure Coast Council of Local Governments, and I'm putting that in the form of a motion. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I, I, you know, when, when we're looking at a trade-off, um, I think uh, item 2A under Commissioner Solari's matters was the uh, National Association of Counties, and we were looking at a, a $2,200 uh, investment, and uh, Commissioner uh, O'Brien clearly pointed out just one of the minor benefits, 
there are many benefits in belonging to NACO. And uh, during some trials and tribulations, they're a phone call away with legal staff and, and support. And I, I most certainly believe that uh, we did the right thing by maintaining the NACO membership. And I want to uh, echo that with uh, the Treasure Coast Council. As it provides for a, a forum, a, an open line of discussion with other municipalities, and, and I believe that it merely, it's, it's a $200 fee for a cooperative effort where we exchange. And, you know, m many of these uh, uh, educational endeavors that uh, w we discuss and go on uh, may cost the taxpayer seven, eight, nine hundred dollars $900 for a, a, a two-day trip. Uh, it's $200. $200 to belong to an association that allows us the opportunity to communicate about other municipalities, with other municipalities, without any concern of, of sunshine violations or, or otherwise, at an open, publicly uh, uh, noticed format. So I, I would definitely oppose uh, retracting from a $200 uh, uh, Treasure Coast Council uh, involvement and uh, as well as the meetings. Well, the, the I'll tell you what, just real quick. Um, I, you know, had the opportunity to see Mayor Gilmore, which we really appreciate you being here. I've learned something from you on, and, you know, as far as, you know, getting a motion in a second and then starting to discuss it. So just real quick, we might be able to just nip that in the bud. I didn't receive a second on this motion. Mr. Gilmore, is there something you'd like to say about the motion that just died? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Then, uh, I will then be, be sending a letter to you saying that I personally am going to withdraw from it because okay. I can't. Mr. Chairman. Do we place Commissioner Slurry on that committee if, if no other commissioner wants to? Okay, it? sounds great. All right, thank you. Okay, is there any further uh, discussion, uh, Commissioner Slurry, under your matters? No, sir. Okay. Uh, next, we have the Emergency Services Station Nine Deductive Change Orders Number One. Move staff approve. recommendation. Got a motion second. to approve staff recommendation for Commissioner O'Brien and a second from Commissioner Flesher. Any no discussion? We'll proceed to vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. The motion passes unanimously. John, thanks for sticking around. <laughs> Is there any further bills to be transacted at this time? Yes, Ms. Renzi. Oh boy. Please name an address for the record. Good morning, Renee Renzi, Waverly Place, Vero Beach. I just want to ask you, when you have a vote on a motion, would you please uh, call the roll? Because it's impossible to tell from out there who's for and, and who's against, and I'd like to know. Typically, w w did I miss one? I, my apologies, I should. Well, you uh, speak so quickly, Wes. Well, I, I, I was trying to get out of here by noon for Commissioner. Uh, one o'clock. Well, Commissioner, or Mayor, excuse me, he had a doctor's yeah. appointment, so I was trying to move things along. But uh, I try to do the individuals that are opposed to the motion. I hear you Would trying, but it doesn't come through. Okay. okay. Will, Is there one you had a question yeah, about? Yeah, I'll be able to get you the answer for it, and I'll tighten up my chairmanship uh, abilities just for you. I well, just assumed some of them. I've got three to two. A couple of votes of three, two, and I'm not sure. Ms. Renzi, if you would, I'll tell you what. Well, you, I, can, yeah, I, can I don't tell want you. to drag it on. I was just going to ask No, I'll, right now, after the meeting, well, well, I'll go ahead and adjourn, and we'll get you that information. Okay. I think on all of them, Solari and I were the two. If yeah. there's no further business to be transacted, though, at this time, that, that, that's I declare this meeting adjourned.